Norwegian Wood, Disc Five. Naoko brought a large white candle from the kitchen. I lit it, dripped a little wax into a plate, and stood it up. Naoko used the flame to light a cigarette. As the three of us sat facing the candle amid these hushed surroundings, it began to seem as if we were the only ones left on some far edge of the world. The still shadows of the moonlight and the swaying shadows of the candlelight met and melded on the white walls of the apartment. Naoko and I sat next to each other on the sofa, and Deko settled into the rocking chair facing us. How about some wine? Deko asked me. You're allowed to drink? I asked with some surprise. Well, not really, said Deko, scratching an earlobe with a hint of embarrassment. But they pretty much let it go. If it's just wine or beer, and you don't drink too much, I've got a friend on the staff who buys me a little now and then. We have our drinking parties," said Naoko with a mischievous air. "Just the two of us." "That's nice," I said. Naoko took a bottle of white wine from the refrigerator, opened it with a corkscrew, and brought three glasses. The wine had a clear, delicious flavor that seemed almost homemade. When the record ended, Deko brought a guitar out from under her bed, and after tuning it with a look of fondness for the instrument, she began to play a slow Bach fugue. She missed her fingering every now and then, but it was real Bach, with real feeling, warm, intimate, and filled with the joy of performance. I started playing the guitar here. Said Deko. There are no pianos in the rooms, of course. I'm self-taught, and I don't have guitar hands, so I'll never get very good. But I really love the instrument. It's small and simple and easy, kind of like a warm little room. She played one more short Bach piece, something from a suite. Eyes on the candle flame, sipping wine, listening to Deko's Bach. I felt the tension inside me slipping away. When Deko ended the Bach, Naoko asked her to play a Beatles song. Request time," said Deko, winking at me. "She makes me play Beatles every day, like I'm her music slave." Despite her protest, Deko played a fine Michelle. "That's a good one," she said. "I really like that song." She took a sip of wine and puffed her cigarette. "It makes me feel like I'm in a big meadow in a soft rain." Then she played "Nowhere Man" and "Julia." Now and then, as she played, she would close her eyes and shake her head. Afterward, she would go back to the wine and the cigarette. Play Norwegian Wood," said Naoko, beckoning Cat from the kitchen. It was a coin bank, and Naoko dropped a hundred yen piece from her purse into its slot. "What's this all about?" I asked. "It's a rule," said Naoko. When I request Norwegian wood, I have to put a hundred yen into the bank. It's my favorite, so I make a point of paying for it. I make a request when I really want to hear it, and that way I get my cigarette money," said Deko. Deko gave her fingers a good flexing and then played Norwegian wood. Again, she played with real feeling, but never allowed it to become sentimental. I took a hundred yen coin from my pocket and dropped it into the bank. Thank you," said Deko with a sweet smile. "That song can make me feel so sad," said Naoko. "I don't know. I guess I imagine myself wandering in a deep wood. I'm all alone, and it's cold and dark, and nobody comes to save me. That's why Deko never plays it unless I request it. Sounds like Casablanca." Deko said with a laugh. She followed Norwegian Wood with a few bossa novas while I kept my eyes on Naoko. As she had said in her letter, she looked healthier than before, sun tanned, her body firmed up from exercise and outdoor work. Her eyes were the same deep, clear pools they had always been, and her small lips still trembled shyly. But overall, her beauty had begun to change to that of a mature woman. Almost gone now was the sharp edge, the chilling sharpness of a thin blade, that could be glimpsed in the shadows of her beauty, 
in the place of which there hovered now a uniquely soothing, quiet calm. I felt moved by this new, gentle beauty of hers, and amazed to think that a woman could change so much in the course of half a year. I felt as drawn to her as ever, perhaps more than before. But the thought of what she had lost in the meantime also gave me cause for regret. Never again would she have that self-centered beauty that seems to take its own independent course in adolescent girls and no one else. Naoko said she wanted to hear about how I was spending my days. I talked about the student strike and about Nagasawa. This was the first time I had ever said anything to her about him. I found it challenging to give her an accurate account of his odd humanity, his unique philosophy, and his uncentered morality. But Naoko seemed finally to grasp what I was trying to tell her. I hid the fact that I went out hunting girls with him, revealing only that the one person in the dorm I spent any real time with was this unusual guy. All the while, Reiko went through another practice of the Bach fugue she had played before, taking occasional breaks Sounds for like wine a and cigarettes. Person. Said Naoko. He is strange, I said. But you like him? I'm not sure, I said. I guess I can't say I like him. Nagasawa is beyond liking or not liking. He doesn't try to be liked. In that sense, he's a very honest guy, even stoic. He doesn't try to fool anybody. Stoic? Sleeping with all those girls? Now that is weird, said Naoko laughing. How many girls has he slept with? It's probably up to 80 now, I said. But in his case, the higher the numbers go, the less each individual act seems to mean, which is what I think he's trying to accomplish. And you call that stoic? For him, it is. Naoko thought about my words for a minute. I think he's a lot sicker in the head than I am, she said. So do I, I said. But he can put all his warped qualities into a logical system. He's brilliant. If you brought him here, he'd be out in two days. Oh, sure, I know all that, he'd say. I understand everything you're doing here. He's that kind of guy. The kind people respect. I guess I'm the opposite of brilliant, said Naoko. I don't understand anything they're doing here, any better than I understand myself. It's not because you're not smart, I said. You're normal. I've got tons of things I don't understand about myself. We're both normal, ordinary. Naoko raised her feet to the edge of the sofa and rested her chin on her knees. I want to know more about you, she said. I'm just an ordinary guy. Ordinary family, ordinary education, ordinary face, ordinary grades, ordinary thoughts in my head. You're such a big Scott Fitzgerald fan. Wasn't he the one who said you shouldn't trust anybody who calls himself an ordinary man? You lent me the book, said Naoko with a mischievous smile. True, I said. But this is no affectation. I really, truly believe deep down that I'm an ordinary person. Can you find something in me that's not ordinary? Of course I can, said Naoko with a hint of impatience. Don't you get it? Why do you think I slept with you? Because I was so drunk I would have slept with anyone? No, of course I don't think that, I said. Naoko remained silent for a long time, staring at her toes. At a loss for words, I took another drink of wine. How many girls have you slept with, Toru? Naoko asked in a tiny voice as if the thought had just crossed her mind. Eight or nine? I answered the truthfully. Into her lap. You're not even twenty years old, she said. What kind of life are you leading? Naoko kept silent and watched me with those clear eyes of hers. I told Deko about the first girl I'd slept with and how we had broken up. I had found it impossible to love her, I explained. I went on to tell her about my sleeping with one girl after another under Nagasawa's tutelage. I'm not trying to make excuses, but I was in pain. 
I said to Naoko. Here I was, seeing you almost every week and talking with you and knowing that the only one in your heart was Kizuki. It hurt. It really hurt. And I think that's why I slept with girls I didn't know. Naoko shook her head for a few moments, and then she raised her face to look at me. You asked me that time why I had never slept with Kizuki, didn't you? Do you still want to know? I guess it's something I really ought to know, I said. I think so too, said Naoko. The dead will always be dead, but we have to go on living. I nodded. Reiko played the same difficult passage over and over, trying to get it right. I was ready to sleep with him, said Naoko, unclasping her barrette and letting her hair down. She toyed with the butterfly shape in her hands. And of course he wanted to sleep with me. So we tried. We tried a lot. But it never worked. We couldn't do it. I didn't know why then, and I still don't know why. I loved him, and I wasn't worried about losing my virginity. I would have been glad to do anything he wanted. But it never worked. Naoko lifted the hair she had let down and fastened it with the barrette. I couldn't get wet, she said in a tiny voice. I never opened to him. So it always hurt. I was just too dry. It hurt too much. We tried everything we could think of, creams and things. But still, it hurt me. So I used my fingers or my lips. I would always do it for him that way. You know what I mean. I nodded in silence. Naoko cast her gaze through the window at the moon, which looked bigger and brighter now than it had before. I never wanted to talk about any of this, she said. I wanted to shut it up in my heart. I wish I still could. But I have to talk about it. I don't know the answer. I mean, I was plenty wet the time I slept with you, wasn't I? Uh-huh, I said. I was wet from the minute you walked into my apartment the night of my 20th birthday. I wanted you to hold me. I wanted you to take my clothes off and touch me all over and get inside me. I had never felt like that before. Why is that? Why do things happen that way? I mean... I really loved him, I said. You want to know why you felt that way about me, even though you didn't love me? I'm sorry, said Naoko. I don't mean to hurt you, but this much you have to understand. Kizuki and I had a truly special relationship. We had been together from the time we were three. It's how we grew up, always together, always talking. Understanding each other perfectly. The first time we kissed, it was in the sixth grade, was just wonderful. The first time I had my period, I ran to him and cried like a baby. We were that close. So after he died, I didn't know how to relate to other people. I didn't know what it means to love another person. She reached for her wine glass on the table, but managed only to knock it onto the floor, spilling the wine on the carpet. I crouched down and retrieved the glass, setting it on the table. Did she want to drink some more? I asked. Naoko remained silent for a while, then suddenly burst into tears, trembling all over. Slumping forward, she buried her face in her hands and sobbed with all the suffocating violence she had had that night with me. Reiko laid her guitar down and sat by Naoko, caressing her back. When she put an arm across Naoko's shoulders, Naoko pressed her face against Reiko's chest like a baby. You know, Reiko said to me, it might be a good idea for you to go out for a little walk. Maybe twenty minutes. Sorry, but I think that would help. I nodded and stood, pulling a sweater on over my shirt. Thanks for stepping in, I said to Deco. 
Don't mention it, she said with a wink. This is not your fault. Don't worry, by the time you come back, she'll be okay. My feet carried me down the road, which was illuminated by the oddly unreal light of the moon, and into the woods. Beneath that moonlight, all sounds were a strange reverberation. The hollow sound of my own footsteps seemed to come from another direction, as if I were hearing someone walking on the bottom of the sea. Behind me, every now and then, I would hear a crack or a rustle. A heavy pall hung over the forest, as if the animals of the night were holding their breath, waiting for me to pass. Where the road sloped upward beyond the trees, I sat and looked toward the building where Naoko lived. It was easy to tell which room was hers. All I had to do was find the one window toward the back where a faint light trembled. I focused on that point of light for a long, long time. It made me think of something like the final throb of a soul's dying embers. I wanted to cut my hands over what was left and keep it alive. I went on watching it the way Jay Gatsby watched that tiny light on the opposite shore night after night. When I walked back to the front entrance of the building half an hour later, I could hear Deco practicing the guitar. I padded up the stairs and tapped on the apartment door. Inside, I found no sign of Naoko. Deco sat alone on the carpet, playing her guitar. She pointed toward the bedroom door to let me know Naoko was in there. Then she set the guitar down on the floor and took a seat on the sofa, inviting me to sit next to her and dividing what wine was left between our two glasses. Naoko is fine, she said, touching my knee. Don't worry. All she has to do is rest for a while. She'll calm down. She was just a little upset. How about taking a walk with me in the meantime? Good, I said. Deko and I ambled down a road illuminated by street lamps. When we reached the area by the tennis and basketball courts, we sat on a bench. She picked up a basketball from under the bench and turned it in her hands. Then she asked me if I played tennis. I knew how to play, I said, but I was bad at it. How about basketball? Not my strongest sport, I said. What is your strongest sport? Deko asked, wrinkling the corners of her eyes with a smile. Aside from sleeping with girls. I'm not so good at that either, I said, stung by her words. Just kidding, she said. Don't get mad. But really, though, what are you good at? Nothing special. I have things I like to do. For instance? Hiking trips. Swimming. Reading. You like to do things alone, then? I guess so. I can never get excited about games you play with other people. I can't get into them. I lose interest. Then you have to come here in the winter. We do cross-country skiing. I'm sure you'd like that. Tramping around in the snow all day, working up a good sweat. Under the street lamp, Deko stared at her right hand as if she were inspecting an antique musical instrument. Does Naoko get like that often? I asked. Every now and then, said Deko, now looking at her left hand. Every once in a while, she'll get worked up and cry like that. But that's okay. She's letting her feelings out. The scary thing is not being able to do that. Then your feelings build up and harden and die inside. That's when you're in big trouble. Did I say something I shouldn't have? Not a thing. Don't worry. Just speak your mind honestly. That's the best thing. It may hurt a little sometimes, and somebody may get worked up the way Naoko did. But in the long run, it's the best thing. That's what you should do if you're serious about making Naoko well again. Like I told you in the beginning, you should think not so much about wanting to help her as wanting to recover yourself by helping her to recover. That's the way it's done here. So you have to be honest and say everything that comes to mind while you're here at least. Nobody does that in the outside world, right? 
I guess not. I've seen all kinds said, of people come and go in my seven years here, said Deco. Maybe too many people. So I can usually tell by looking at a person whether they're going to get better or not, almost by instinct. But in Naoko's case, I'm not sure. I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen to her. For all I know, she could be a hundred percent recovered next month, or she could go on like this for years. So I really can't tell you what to do aside from the most generalized kind of advice: to be honest, or to help each other. What makes Naoko such a hard case for you? Probably because I like her so much. I think my emotions get in the way, and I can't see her clearly. I mean, I really like her, but aside from that, she has a bunch of different problems that are all tangled up, so it's hard to unravel any one of them. It may take a very long time to undo them all. Or something could trigger them to come unraveled all at once. It's kind of like that, which is why I can't be sure about her. She picked up the basketball again, twirled it in her hands, and bounced it on the ground. The most important thing is not to let yourself get impatient, Deco said. This is one more piece of advice I have for you: don't get impatient. Even if things are so tangled up you can't do anything, don't get desperate or blow a fuse and start yanking on one particular thread before it's ready to come undone. You have to figure it's going to be a long process, and that you'll work on things slowly, one at a time. Do you think you can do that? I can try, I said. It may take a very long time, you know, and even then she may not recover completely. Have you thought about that? I nodded. Waiting is hard," she said, bouncing the ball, "especially for someone your age. You just sit and wait for her to get better, without deadlines or guarantees. Do you think you can do that? Do you love Naoko that much? I'm not sure," I said honestly. Like Naoko, I'm not really sure what it means to love another person. Though she meant it a little differently, I do want to try my best. Though, I have to, or else I won't know where to go. Like you said before, Naoko and I have to save each other. It's the only way for either of us to be saved. And are you going to go on sleeping with girls you pick up? I don't know what to do about that either. I said, "What do you think?" Should I just keep waiting and masturbating? I'm not in complete、People、control the there either. Ground and patted my knee. Look, she said, I'm not telling you to stop sleeping with girls. If you're okay with that, then it's okay. It's your life after all. It's something you have to decide. All I'm saying is you shouldn't use yourself up in some unnatural form. Do you see what I'm getting at? It would be such a waste. The years nineteen and twenty are a crucial stage in the maturation of character, and if you allow yourself to become warped when you're that age, it will cause you pain when you're older. It's true. So think about it carefully. If you want to take care of Naoko, take care of yourself too. I said I would think about it. I was twenty once myself, once upon a time. Would you believe it? I believe it, of course. Deep down, deep down, I said with a smile, and I was cute too, not as cute as Naoko, but pretty damn cute. I didn't have all these wrinkles. I said I liked her wrinkles a lot. She thanked me. But don't ever tell another woman that you find her wrinkles attractive, she added. I like to hear it, but I'm the exception. I'll be careful. I said. She slipped a wallet from her pants pocket and handed me a photo from the card holder. It was a color snapshot of a cute girl around ten years old, wearing skis and brightly colored ski clothes, and standing on the snow with a sweet smile for the camera. Don't you think she's pretty? My daughter, said Deco. She sent me this in January, 
She's in, what, fourth grade now? She's got your smile, I said, returning the photo. Neko put the wallet back into her pocket and with a sniff put a cigarette between her lips and lit up. I was going to be a concert pianist, she said. I had talent, and people recognized it and made a fuss over me while I was growing up. I won competitions and had top grades in the conservatory, and I was set to study in Germany after graduation. Not a cloud on the horizon. Everything worked out perfectly, and when it didn't, there was always somebody to fix it. But then, one day something happened, and it all blew apart. I was in my senior year at the conservatory, and there was a fairly important competition coming up. I practiced for it constantly, but all of a sudden, the little finger of my left hand stopped moving. I don't know why, it just did. I tried massaging it, soaking it in hot water, taking off from practice for a few days. Nothing worked. So then I got scared and went to the doctor's. They tried all kinds of tests, but they couldn't come up with anything. There was nothing wrong with the finger itself, and the nerves were okay, they said. There was no reason it should stop moving. The problem must be psychological. So I went to a psychiatrist, but he didn't really know what was going on either. Probably pre-competition stress, he figured, and told me to get away from the piano for a while and let the smoke out. Then she bent her neck to the side a few times. So I went to recuperate at my grandmother's place on the coast in Izu. I figured I'd forget about that particular competition and really relax, spend a couple of weeks away from the piano doing anything I wanted. But it was hopeless. Piano was all I could think about. Maybe my finger would never move again. How would I live if that happened? The same thoughts kept going round and round in my brain. And no wonder. Piano had been my whole life up to that point. I had started playing when I was four and grew up thinking about the piano and nothing else. I never did housework to make sure I wouldn't injure my fingers. People paid attention to me for that one thing, my talent at the piano. Take the piano away from a girl who's grown up like that and what's left? So then, snap. My mind became a complete jumble. Total darkness. She dropped her cigarette to the ground and stamped it out. And then she bent her neck a few times again. That was the end of my dream of becoming a concert pianist. I spent two months in the hospital. My finger started to move shortly after I went in, so I was able to return to the conservatory and graduate, but something inside me had vanished. Some jewel of energy or something had disappeared, evaporated from inside my body. The doctor said I lacked the mental strength to become a professional pianist and advised me to abandon the idea. So, after graduating, I took pupils and taught them at home. But the pain I felt was excruciating. It was as if my life had ended. Here I was in my early twenties, and the best part of my life had ended. Do you see how terrible that would be? I had had my hands on such potential, and I woke up one day, and all of it was gone. No one would applaud me. No one would make a big fuss over me. No one would tell me how wonderful I was. I spent day after day in the house teaching neighborhood children buyer exercises and sonatinas. I felt so miserable, I cried all the time. To think what I had missed. I would hear about people who were far less talented than I was taking second place in a competition or holding a recital in such and such a hall. And the tears would pour out of me. My parents walked around me on tiptoe afraid of hurting me. But I knew how disappointed they were. All of a sudden, the daughter they had been so proud of was a returnee from a mental hospital. They couldn't even marry me off. When you're living with people, 
You sense what they're feeling, and I hated it. I was afraid to go out, afraid the neighbors were talking about me. So then, snap, it happened again. The jumble, the darkness. It happened when I was 24, and this time I spent seven months in the sanatorium. Not this place, a regular insane asylum with high walls and locked gates. A filthy place without pianos. I didn't know what to do with myself. All I knew was I wanted to get out of there as soon as I could. So I struggled desperately to get better. Seven months. A long seven months. That's when my wrenching her lips from side to side. I hadn't been out of the hospital for long when I met a man and got married. He was a year younger than me, an engineer who worked in an airplane manufacturing company, and one of my pupils. A nice man. He didn't say a lot, but he was warm and sincere. He had been taking lessons from me for six months when all of a sudden he asked me to marry him. Just like that. One day, when we were having tea after his lesson, can you believe it? We had never dated or held hands. He took me totally off guard. I told him I couldn't get married. I said I liked him and thought he was a nice person, but that for certain reasons I couldn't marry him. He wanted to know what those reasons were, so I explained everything to him with complete honesty, that I had been hospitalized twice for mental breakdowns. I told him everything, what the cause had been, my condition, and the possibility that it could happen again. He said he needed time to think, and I encouraged him to take all the time he needed. But when he came for his lesson a week later, he said he still wanted to marry me. I asked him to wait three months. We would see each other for three months, I said, and if he still wanted to marry me at that point, we would talk about it again. We dated once a week for three months. We went everywhere and talked about everything, and I got to like him a lot. When I was with him, I felt as if my life had finally come back to me. It gave me a wonderful sense of relief to be alone with him. I could forget all those terrible things that had happened. So what if I hadn't been able to become a concert pianist? So what if I had spent time in mental hospitals? My life hadn't ended. Life was still full of wonderful things I hadn't experienced. If only for having made me feel that way, I felt tremendously grateful to him. After three months went by, he asked me again to marry him. And this is what I said to him. If you want to sleep with me, I don't mind. I've never slept with anybody, and I'm very fond of you, so if you want to make love to me, I don't mind at all. But marrying me is a whole different matter. If you marry me, you take on all my troubles, and they're a lot worse than you can imagine. He said he didn't care that he didn't just want to sleep with me. He wanted to marry me, to share everything I had inside me. And he meant it. He was the kind of person who would only say what he really meant and do anything he said. So I agreed to marry him. It was all I could do. We got married, let's see, four months later, I think it was. He fought with his parents over me, and they disowned him. He was from an old family that lived in a rural part of Shikoku. They had my background investigated and found out that I had been hospitalized twice. No wonder they opposed the marriage. So anyhow, we didn't have a wedding ceremony. We just went to the ward office and registered our marriage and took a trip to Hakone for two nights. That was plenty for us. We were happy. And finally, I remained a virgin until the day I married. I was 25 years old. Can you believe it? Deiko sighed and picked that up the basketball as long as I was with again. him, I would be all right. She went on. As long as I was with him, my troubles would stay away. That's the most important thing for a sickness like ours, a sense of trust. If I put myself in this person's hands, I'll be okay. If my condition starts to worsen, even the slightest bit, if a screw comes loose... 
He'll notice it right away, and with tremendous care and patience, he'll fix it. He'll tighten the screw again, put all the jumbled threads back in place. If we have that sense of trust, our sickness stays away. No more snap. I was so happy. Life was so great. I felt as if someone had pulled me out of a cold, raging sea and wrapped me in a blanket and laid me in a warm bed. I had a baby two years after we were married, and then my hands were really full. I practically forgot about my sickness. I get up in the morning and do the housework and take care of the baby and feed my husband when he came home from work. It was the same thing day after day, but I was happy. It was probably the happiest time of my life. How many years did it last? I wonder. At least until I was thirty-one, and then, all of a sudden, snap! It happened again. I fell apart. Deco lit a cigarette. The wind had died down. The smoke rose straight up and disappeared into the darkness of night. Just then, I realized that the sky was filled with stars. Something happened, I asked. Yes, she said. Something very strange, as if a trap had been set for me. Even now, it gives me a chill just to think about it. Deco rubbed a temple with her free hand. I'm sorry, though, making you listen to all this talk about me. You came here to see Naoko, not listen to my story. I'd really like to hear it, though. I said, "If you don't mind, I'd like to hear the rest." Well, Deco began. When our daughter entered kindergarten, I started playing again, little by little. Not for anyone else, but for myself. I started with short pieces by Bach. Mozart, Scarlatti. After such a long blank period, of course, my feel for the music didn't come back right away, and my fingers wouldn't move the way they used to. But I was thrilled to be playing the piano again. With my hands on the keys, I realized how much I had loved music, and how much I had hungered for it. To be able to perform music for yourself is a wonderful thing. I had been playing from the time I was four years old. But it occurred to me that I had never once played for myself. I had always been trying to pass a test or practice an assignment or impress somebody. Those are all important things, of course, if you are going to master an instrument. But after a certain age, you have to start performing for yourself. That's what music is. I had to drop out of the elite course and pass my thirty-first birthday before I was finally able to see that. I would send my child off to kindergarten and hurry through the housework, then take an hour or two playing music I liked. So far, so good, right? I nodded in affirmation. Then one day, I had a visit from one of the ladies of the neighborhood, someone I at least knew well enough to say hello to on the street, asking me to give her daughter piano lessons. I didn't know about the daughter. Though we lived in the same general neighborhood, our houses were still pretty far apart. But according to the woman, her daughter used to pass my house and loved to hear me play. She had seen me at some point too, and now she was pestering her mother to get me to teach her. She was in her second year of middle school and had taken lessons from a number of people, but things had not gone well for one reason or another, and now she had no teacher. I turned her down. I had had that blank of several years, and while it might have made sense for me to take on an absolute beginner, it would have been impossible for me to pick up with someone who had had lessons for a number of years. Besides, I was too busy taking care of my own child, and though I didn't say this to the woman, nobody can deal with the kind of child who changes teachers constantly. So then the woman asked me to at least do her daughter the favor of meeting her once. This was a fairly pushy lady, and I could see she was not going to let me off the hook easily. So I agreed to meet the girl, but just meet her. Three days later, the girl came to the house by herself. 
She was an absolute angel with a kind of pure, sweet, transparent beauty. I had never, and have never seen such a beautiful little girl. She had long, shiny hair as black as freshly ground India ink, slim, graceful arms and legs, bright eyes, and a soft little mouth that looked as if someone had just made it. I couldn't speak when I first saw her; she was so beautiful. Sitting on my couch, she turned my living room into a gorgeous parlor. It hurt to look straight at her. I had to squint. So, anyhow, that's what she was like. I can still picture her clearly. Nicol narrowed her eyes as if she were actually picturing the girl. We talked for a whole hour. Talked about all kinds of things: music, her school, just everything. I could see right off she was a smart one. She knew how to hold a conversation. She had clear, sharp opinions and a natural gift for captivating the other person. Frighteningly so. Exactly what it was that made her frightening, I couldn't tell at the time. It just struck me how frighteningly intelligent she was. But in her presence, I lost any normal powers of judgment I might have had. She was so young and beautiful. I felt overwhelmed to the point of seeing myself as an inferior specimen, a clumsy excuse for a human being who could only have negative thoughts about her because of my own warped and filthy mind. Nicole shook her head several times. If I were as pretty and smart as she was, I'd have been a more normal human being. What more could you want if you were that smart and that beautiful? Why would you have to torment and walk all over your weaker inferiors if everybody loved you so much? What reason could there possibly be for acting that way? Did she do something terrible to you? Well, let me just say the girl was a pathological liar. She was sick, pure and simple. She made up everything, and while she was making up her stories, she would come to believe them. And then she would change things around her to fit her story. She had such a quick mind; she could always keep a step ahead of you and take care of things that would ordinarily strike you as odd. So it would never cross your mind that she was lying. First of all, no one would ever suspect that such a pretty little girl would lie about the most ordinary things. I certainly didn't. She told me tons of lies for six months before I had the slightest inkling that anything was wrong. She lied about everything, and I never suspected. I know it sounds crazy. What did she lie about? When I say everything, I mean everything. Nicol gave a sarcastic laugh. When people tell a lie about something, they have to make up a bunch of lies to go with the first one. Mythomania is the word for it. When the usual mythomaniac tells lies, they're usually the innocent kind, and most people notice. But not with that girl. To protect herself, she'd tell hurtful lies without batting an eyelash. She'd use everything she could get her hands on, and she would lie either more or less depending on who she was talking to. To her mother or close friends, who would know right away, she hardly ever lied. Or if she had to tell one, she'd be really, really careful to tell lies that wouldn't come out. Or if they did come out, she'd find an excuse or apologize in that clingy voice of hers, with tears pouring out of her beautiful eyes. No one could stay mad at her then. Still don't know why she chose me. Was I another victim to her, or a source of salvation? I just don't know. Of course, it hardly matters now. Now that everything is over, now that I'm like this, a short silence followed. She repeated what her mother had told me, that she had been moved when she heard me playing as she passed the house. She had seen me on the street a few times too, and begun to worship me. She actually used that word, worship. It made me turn bright red. I mean, to be worshipped. By such a beautiful little doll of a girl, I don't think it was an absolute lie, though. I was in my thirties already, of course, and I could never be as beautiful and bright as she was, and I had no special talent. But I must have had something that drew her to me.
something that was missing in her, I would guess. Which must have been what got her interested in me to begin with. I believe that now, looking back. And I'm not boasting. No, I think I know what you mean. She had brought some music with her and asked if she could play for me. So I let her. It was a Bach invention. Her performance was interesting. Or should I say strange? It just wasn't ordinary. Of course, it wasn't polished. She hadn't been going to a professional school, and what lessons she had taken had been an on-and-off kind of thing. She was very much self-taught. Her sound was untrained. She'd have been rejected immediately if this had been a music school audition. But she made it work. Ninety percent was just terrible. But the other ten percent was there. She made it sing. It was music. And this was a Bach invention. So I got interested in her. I wanted to know what she was all about. Needless to say, the world is full of kids who can play Bach way better than she could. Twenty times better. But most of their performances would have nothing to them. They'd be hollow, empty. This girl's technique was bad. But she had that little bit of something that could draw people, or draw me at least, into her performance. So I decided it might be worthwhile to teach her. Of course, retraining her at that point to where she could become a pro was out of the question. But I felt it might be possible to make her into the kind of happy pianist I was then, and still am. Someone who could enjoy making music for herself. This turned out to be an empty hope, though. She was not the kind of person who quietly goes about doing things for herself. This was a child who would make detailed calculations to use every means at her disposal to impress other people. She knew exactly what she had to do to make people admire and praise her. And she knew exactly what kind of performance it would take to draw me in. She had calculated everything, I'm sure, and put everything she had into practicing the most important passages over and over again for my benefit. I can see her doing it. Even now, after all this came clear to me, I believe it was a wonderful performance. And I would feel the same chills down my spine if I could hear it again. Knowing all I know about her flaws, her cunning, and her lies, I would still feel it. I'm telling you, there are such things in this world. Deco cleared her throat with a dry rasp and broke off her story. So, did you take her as a pupil? I asked. Sure I did. One lesson a week. Saturday mornings. Saturday was a day off at her school. She never missed a lesson. She was never late. She was an ideal pupil. She always practiced for her lessons. After every lesson, we'd have some cake and chat. At that point, Deco looked at her watch as if suddenly remembering something. Don't you think we should be getting back to the room? I'm a little worried about Naoko. I'm sure you haven't forgotten about her now, have you? Of course not, I laughed. It's just that I was drawn into your story. If you'd like to hear the rest, I'll tell it to you tomorrow. It's a long story. Too long for one sitting. You're a regular Shehrazad. I know, she said, joining her laughter with mine. You'll never get back to Tokyo. We retraced our steps through the path in the woods and returned to the apartment. The candles had been extinguished and the living room lights were out. The bedroom door was open and the lamp on the night table was on, its pale light spilling into the living room. Naoko sat alone on the sofa in the gloom. She had changed into a loose-fitting blue nightgown, its collar pulled tight around her neck, her legs folded under her on the sofa. Reko approached her and rested a hand on the crown of her head. Are you all right now? I'm fine. Sorry, answered Naoko in a tiny voice. Then she turned toward me and repeated her apology. I must have scared you. A little, I said with a smile. 
Come here, she said. When I sat down next to her, Naoko, her legs still folded, leaned toward me until her face was nearly touching my ear, as if she was going to share a secret with me. Then she planted a soft kiss by my ear. Sorry, she said once more, this time directly into my ear, her voice subdued. Then she moved away from me. Sometimes, she said, I get so confused. I don't know what's happening. That happens to me all the time, I said. Naoko smiled and looked at me. If you don't mind, I said, I'd like to hear more about you, about your life here, what you do every day, Naoko the people you meet. about her daily routine in this place, speaking in short but crystal clear phrases. Wake up at six in the morning, breakfast in the apartment, clean out the birdhouse, then usually farm work. She took care of the vegetables. Before or after lunch, she would have either an hour-long session with her doctor or a group discussion. In the afternoon, she could choose from among courses that might interest her, outside work or sports. She had taken several courses, French, knitting, piano, ancient history. Reiko is teaching me piano, she said. She also teaches guitar. We all take turns as pupils or teachers. Somebody with fluent French teaches French. One person who used to be in social studies teaches history. Another good at knitting teaches knitting. That's a pretty impressive school right there. Unfortunately, I don't have anything I can teach anyone. Neither do I, I said. I put a lot more energy into my studies here than I ever did in college. I work hard and enjoy it. A lot. What do you do after supper? Talk with Deco, read, listen to records, go to other people's apartments and play games, stuff like that. I do guitar practice and write my autobiography, said Deco. Autobiography? Just kidding, Deco laughed. We go to bed around ten o'clock. Pretty healthy lifestyle, wouldn't you say? We sleep like babies. I looked at my watch. It was a few minutes before nine. I guess you'll be getting sleepy soon. That's okay. We can stay up late today, said Naoko. I haven't seen you in such a long time. I want to talk more. So talk. When I was alone before, all of a sudden I started thinking about the old days, I said. Do you remember when Kizuki and I came to visit you at the hospital? The one on the seashore? I think it was the second year of high school. When I had the chest operation, Naoko said with a smile. Sure, I remember. You and Kizuki came on a motorcycle. You brought me a box of chocolates, and they were all melted together. They were so hard to eat. I don't know, it seems like such a long time ago. Yeah, really. I think you were writing a poem then, a long one. All girls write poems at that age, Naoko tittered. What reminded you of that all of a sudden? I wonder. The smell of the sea wind, the oleanders. Before I knew it, they just popped into my head. Did Kizuki come to see you at the hospital a lot? We had a big fight about that afterward. He came once, and then he came with you, and that was it for him. He was terrible. And that first time, he couldn't sit still, and he only stayed about ten minutes. He brought me some oranges and mumbled all this stuff I couldn't understand, and he peeled an orange for me and mumbled more stuff, and he was out of there. He said he had a thing about hospitals. Naoko laughed. He was always a kid about that kind of stuff. I mean... Nobody likes hospitals, right? That's why people visit people in hospitals. To make them feel better and perk up their spirits and stuff. But Kizuki just didn't get it. He wasn't so bad when the two of us came to see you, though. He was just his usual self. Because you were there, said Naoko. He was always like that around you. He struggled to keep his weaknesses hidden. 
I'm sure he was very fond of you. He made a point of letting you see only his best side. He wasn't like that with me. He let his guard down. He could be really moody. One minute he'd be chattering away, and the next thing he'd be depressed. It happened all the time. He was like that from the time he was little. He did keep trying to change himself, to improve himself, though. Naoko recrossed her legs atop the sofa. He tried hard, but it didn't do any good, and that would make him really angry and sad. There was so much about him that was fine and beautiful, but he could never find the confidence he needed. I've got to do that. I've got to change this, he was always thinking. Right up to the end. Poor Kizuki. Still, though, I said, if it's true that he was always struggling to show me his best side, I'd say he succeeded. His best side was all that I could see. Naoko smiled. He'd be thrilled if he could hear you say that. You were his only friend. And Kizuki was my only friend, I said. There was never anybody I could really call a friend, before him or after him. That's why I loved being with the two of you. His best side was all that I could see then, too. I could relax and stop worrying when the three of us were together. Those were my favorite times. I don't know how you felt about it. I used to worry about what you were thinking, I said, giving my head a shake. The problem was that that kind of thing couldn't go on forever, said Naoko. Such perfect little circles are impossible to maintain. Kizuki knew it, and I knew it. And so did you. Am I right? To tell you the truth, though... I nodded, Naoko went on. I loved his weak side, too. I loved it as much as I loved his good side. There was absolutely nothing mean or sneaky about him. He was weak. That's all. I tried to tell him that, but he wouldn't believe me. He'd always tell me it was because we had been together from the time we were three. I knew him too well, he'd say. I couldn't tell the difference between his strong points and his flaws. They were all the same to me. He couldn't change my mind about him, though. I went on loving him just the same. And I could never be interested in anyone else. Naoko looked at me with a sad smile. Our boy-girl relationship was really unusual, too. It was as if we were physically joined somewhere. If we happened to be apart, some special gravitational force would pull us back together again. It was the most natural thing in the world when we became boyfriend and girlfriend. It was nothing we had to think about or make any choices about. We started kissing at twelve and petting at thirteen. I'd go to his room or he'd come to my room and I'd finish him off with my hands. It never occurred to me that we were being precocious. It just happened as a matter of course. If he wanted to play with my breasts or vagina, I didn't mind at all. Or if he had semen he wanted to get rid of, I didn't mind helping with that either. I'm sure it would have shocked us both if someone had accused us of doing anything wrong because we weren't. We were just doing what we were supposed to do. We had always shown each other every part of our bodies. It was almost as if we owned each other's bodies jointly. For a while, at least, we made sure we didn't go any further than what I've said, though. We were afraid of getting me pregnant, and had almost no idea at that point of how you go about preventing it. Anyhow, that's how Kizuki and I grew up together hand in hand, an inseparable pair. We had almost no sense of the oppressiveness of sex or the anguish that comes with the sudden swelling of the ego that ordinary kids experience when they reach puberty. We were totally open about sex. And where our egos were concerned, the way we absorbed and shared each other's, we had no strong awareness of them. Do you see what I mean? I think so. I said. We couldn't bear to be apart. So if Kizuki had lived, I'm sure we would have been together, loving each other, and gradually growing unhappy. 
unhappy? Why's that? With her fingers, Naoko combed her hair back several times. She had taken her barrette off, which made the hair fall over her face when she dropped、Because、her head forward. We would have had to pay the world back what we owed it, she said, raising her eyes to mine. The pain of growing up. We didn't pay when we should have, so now the bills are due. Which is why Kizuki did what he did, and why I'm in here. We were like kids who grew up naked on a desert island. If we got hungry, we just pick a banana. If we got lonely, we go to sleep in each other's arms. But that kind of thing doesn't last forever. We grew up fast and had to enter society, which is why you were so important to us. You were the link connecting us with the outside world. We were struggling through you to fit in with the outside world as best we could. In the end, it didn't work, of course. I nodded. I wouldn't want you to think that we were using you, though. Kizuki really loved you. It just so happened that our connection with you was our first connection with anyone else, and it still is. Kizuki may be dead. But you are still my only link with the outside world, and just as Kizuki loved you, I love you. We never meant to hurt you, but we probably did. We probably ended up making a deep wound in your heart. It never occurred to us that anything like that might happen. Naoko lowered her head again and fell silent. Say, how about a cup of cocoa? Suggested Deko. Good, I'd like some," said Naoko. "I'd like to have some of the brandy I brought, if you don't mind," I said. "Oh, absolutely," said Deko. "Could I have a sip?" "Sure," I said, laughing. Deko brought out two glasses, and we toasted each other. Then she went into the kitchen to make cocoa. Can we talk about something a little more cheerful? Asked Naoko. I didn't happen to have anything cheerful to talk about. I thought, if only Stormtrooper were still around, that guy could inspire a string of stories. A few of those would have made everybody feel good. The best I could do was talk at length about the filthy habits of the guys in the dormitory. I felt sick just talking about something so gross. But Naoko and Deko practically fell over laughing. It was all so new to them. Next, Deko did imitations of mental patients. This was a lot of fun too. Naoko started looking sleepy once eleven o'clock rolled around, so Deko let down the sofa back and gave me a pillow, sheets, If you feel and blankets. Like raping anybody in the middle of the night, don't get the wrong one," said Deko. "The unwrinkled body in the left bed is Naoko's." Liar, mine's the right bed," said Naoko. Deko added, "By the way, I arranged for us to skip some of our afternoon schedule. Why don't the three of us have a little picnic? I know a nice place close by." "Good idea," I said. The women took turns brushing their teeth and withdrew to the bedroom. I poured myself a sip of brandy and stretched out on the sofa bed, going over the day's events from morning to night. It felt like an awfully long day. The room continued to glow white in the moonlight. Aside from the occasional slight creak of a bed, hardly a sound came from the bedroom where Naoko and Deko lay sleeping. Tiny diagrammatic shapes seemed to float in the darkness when I closed my eyes, and my ears sensed the lingering reverberation of Deko's guitar. But neither of these lasted any length of time. Sleep came, and carried me into a mass of warm mud. I dreamed of willows. Both sides of a mountain road were lined with willows. An incredible number of willows. A fairly stiff breeze was blowing, but the branches of the willow trees never swayed. Why should that be? I wondered. And then I saw that every branch of every tree had tiny birds clinging to it. Their weight kept the branches from stirring. I grabbed a stick 
and hit a nearby branch with it, hoping to chase the birds off and allow the branch to sway. But the birds would not leave. Instead of flying away, they turned into bird-shaped metal chunks that crashed to the ground. When I opened my eyes, I felt as if I were seeing the continuation of my dream. The moonlight filled the room with the same soft white glow. As if by reflex, I sat up in bed and started searching for the metal birds, which of course were not there. What I saw instead was Naoko at the foot of the bed, sitting still and alone, staring out through the window. She had drawn her knees up and was resting her chin on them, looking like a hungry orphan. I searched for the watch I had left by my pillow, but it was not in the place where I knew it should be. I figured from the angle of the moonlight that the time must be two or three o'clock in the morning. I felt a violent thirst, but I decided to keep still and continue watching Naoko. She was wearing the same blue nightgown I had seen her in earlier, and on one side her hair was held in place by the butterfly barrette, revealing the beauty of her face in the moonlight. Strange, I thought. She had taken the barrette off before going to bed, place, like a small nocturnal animal that has been lured out by the moonlight. The direction of the glow exaggerated the silhouette of her lips. Seemingly utterly fragile and vulnerable, the silhouette pulsed almost imperceptibly with the beating of her heart or the motions of her inner heart, as if she were whispering soundless words to the darkness. I swallowed in hopes of easing my thirst, but in the stillness of the night, the sound I made was huge. As if this were a signal to her, Naoko stood and glided toward the head of the bed, gown rustling faintly. She knelt on the floor by my pillow, eyes fixed on mine. I stared back at her, but her eyes told me nothing. Strangely transparent, they seemed like windows to a world beyond. But however long I peered into their depths, there was nothing I could see. Our faces were no more than ten inches apart, but she was light years away from me. I reached out and tried to touch her, but Naoko drew back, lips trembling faintly. A moment later, she brought her hands up and began slowly to undo the buttons of her gown. There were seven in all. I felt as if it were the continuation of my dream as I watched her slim, lovely fingers opening the buttons one by one from top to bottom. Seven small white buttons. When she had unfastened them all, Naoko slipped the gown from her shoulders and threw it off completely, like an insect shedding its skin. She had been wearing nothing under the gown. All she had on was the butterfly barrette. Naked now, and still kneeling by the bed, she looked at me. Bathed in the soft light of the moon, Naoko's body had the heartbreaking luster of newborn flesh. When she moved, and she did so almost imperceptibly, the play of light and shadow on her body shifted subtly. The swelling roundness of her breasts, her tiny nipples, the indentation of her navel, her hip bones and pubic hair, all cast grainy shadows, the shapes of which kept changing like ripples spreading over the calm surface of a lake. What perfect flesh, I thought. When had Naoko come to possess such a perfect body? What had happened to the body I held in my arms that night last spring? A sense of imperfection had been what Naoko's body had given me that night as I tenderly undressed her while she cried. Her breasts had seemed hard, the nipples oddly jutting, she was the hips strangely girl, rigid, her body marvelous and alluring. It aroused me that night and swept me along with a gigantic force. But still, as I held her and caressed her and kissed her naked flesh, I felt a strange and powerful awareness of the imbalance and awkwardness of the human body. 
Holding Naoko in my arms, I wanted to explain to her, I am having intercourse with you now. I am inside you. But really, this is nothing. It doesn't matter. It is nothing but the joining of two bodies. All we are doing is telling each other things that can only be told by the rubbing together of two imperfect lumps of flesh. By doing this, we are sharing our imperfection. But of course I could never have said such a thing with any hope of being understood. I just went on holding her tightly. And as I did so, I was able to feel inside her body some kind of stony, foreign matter. Something extra that I could never draw close to. And that sensation both filled my heart for Naoko and gave my erection a terrifying intensity. The body that Naoko revealed before me now, though, was nothing like the one I had held that night. This flesh had been through many changes to be reborn in utter perfection beneath the light of the moon. All signs of girlish plumpness had been stripped away since Kizuki's death, to be replaced by the flesh of a mature woman. So perfect was Naoko's physical beauty now that it aroused nothing sexual in me. I could only stare, astounded, at the lovely curve from waist to hips, the rounded richness of the breasts, the gentle movement with each breath of the slim belly, and the soft, black pubic shadow beneath. She exposed her nakedness to me this way for perhaps five minutes, until at last she wrapped herself in her gown once more and buttoned it from top to bottom. As soon as the last button was in place, she rose and glided toward the bedroom, opened the door silently, and disappeared within. I stayed fixed in place for a very long time until it occurred to me to leave the bed. I retrieved my watch from where it had fallen on the floor and turned it toward the moonlight. The time was 3.40. I went to the kitchen and drank a few glassfuls of water before stretching out in bed again. But sleep never came for me until the morning sunlight crept into every corner of the room, dissolving all traces of the moon's pale glow. I was somewhere on the edge of sleep when Deiko came and smacked me on the cheek, shouting, Morning! Morning! Norwegian Wood. This ends Disc 5. Disc 6. While Deiko straightened out my sofa bed, Naoko went to the kitchen and started making breakfast. She smiled at me and said, Good morning. Good morning. I said in reply. I stood by and watched Naoko as she put water on to boil and sliced some bread, humming all the while. But I could sense nothing in her manner to suggest that she had revealed her naked body to me the night before. Your eyes are red, she said to me as she poured the coffee. Are you okay? I woke up in the middle of the night and couldn't get back to sleep. I bet we were snoring said Deko. Not at all, I said. That's good, said Naoko. He's just being polite, said Deko, yawning. At first I thought that Naoko was embarrassed, or acting innocent for Deko, but her behavior remained unchanged when Deko momentarily left the room, and her eyes had their usual transparent look. How'd you sleep? I asked Naoko. Like a log, she answered with ease. She wore a simple hairpin without any kind of decoration. I didn't know what to make of this, and I continued to feel that way all through breakfast. Buttering my bread or peeling my egg, I kept glancing across the table at Naoko in search of a sign. Why do you keep looking at me like that? She asked with a smile. I think he's in love with somebody, said Deko. Are you in love with somebody? Naoko asked me. Could be, I said, returning her smile. When the two women started joking around at my expense, I gave up trying to think about what had happened in the night and concentrated on my bread and coffee. 
After breakfast, Neko and Naoko said they would be going to feed the birds in the birdhouse. I volunteered to go along. They changed into jeans and work shirts and white rubber boots. Set in a little park behind the tennis courts, the birdhouse had everything in it from chickens and pigeons to peacocks and parrots, and was surrounded by flower beds and shrubberies and benches. Two men in their forties, also apparently sanatorium patients, were raking up leaves that had fallen in the pathways. The women walked over to say good morning to the pair, and Echo got a laugh from them with another of her jokes. Cosmos were blooming in the flower beds, and the shrubberies were extremely well manicured. Spotting Echo, the birds started chattering and flying about、They、inside the, the shed cage. by the cage, and came out with a bag of feed and a garden hose. Naoko screwed the hose on a spigot and turned on the water. Taking care to prevent any birds from flying out, the two of them slipped into the cage. Naoko hosing down the dirt, and Eiko scrubbing the floor with a deck brush. The spray they set up sparkled in the glare of the morning sun. The peacocks flapped around the cage to avoid getting splashed. A turkey raised its head and glowered at me like a crotchety old man. While a parrot on the perch above screeched his displeasure and beat its wings, Neko meowed at the parrot, which slunk over to the far corner, but soon was calling, "Thank you, crazy shithead." I wonder who taught him that kind of language," said Naoko with a sigh. "Not me," said Neko. "I would never do such a thing." She started meowing again, and the parrot shut up. Laughing, Deco explained, "This guy once had a run-in with a cat. Now he's scared to death of him." When they were through cleaning, the two set their tools down and went around filling each of the feeders. Splashing its way through puddles on the floor, the turkey darted to its feed box and plunged its head in, too obsessed with eating to be bothered by Naoko's smacks on its tail. "Do you do this every morning?" I asked Naoko. Every morning, she said, they usually give this job to the new women. It's so easy. Like to see the rabbits? Sure, I said. The rabbit hutch was behind the birdhouse. Some ten rabbits lay inside, asleep in the straw. Naoko swept up their droppings, put feed in their box, and picked up one of the babies, rubbing it against her cheek. Isn't it precious? She gushed. She let me hold it. The warm little ball of fur cringed in my arms, twitching its nose. Don't worry, he won't hurt you," she said to the rabbit, stroking its head with her finger and smiling at me. It was such a radiant smile, without a trace of shadow, that I couldn't help smiling myself. And what about Naoko last night? I wondered. I knew for certain that it had been the real Naoko and not a dream. She had definitely taken her clothes off and shown her naked body to me. Deco whistled a lovely rendition of "Proud Mary" as she stuffed a vinyl bag with the debris they had gathered and tied off the opening. I helped them carry the tools and feed bag to the shed. Morning is my favorite time of day," said Naoko. It's like everything starting out fresh and new. I begin to get sad around noon time, and I hate it when the sun goes down. I live with those same feelings day after day. And while you're living with those feelings, you youngsters get old just like me," said Deco with a smile. "You're thinking about how it's morning now or night, and the next thing you know, you're old." But you like getting old," said Naoko. "Not really," said Deko. "But I sure don't wish I was young again." "Why not?" I asked. "Because it's such a pain in the neck," she said. Then she tossed her broom in and closed the door of the shed, whistling "Proud Mary" all the while. Back at the apartment, the women changed their rubber boots for tennis shoes. And said they'd be going to the farm. Deco suggested I stay behind with a book or something, 
because the work would be no fun to watch, and they would be doing it as part of a group. And while you're waiting, you can wash the pile of dirty underwear we left by the sink, she added. You're kidding, I said, taken aback. Of course I am, she laughed. You're so sweet, isn't he, Naoko? He really is, said Naoko, laughing with her. I'll work on my German, I said with a sigh. Yeah, do your homework like a good boy, said Deko. We'll be back before lunch. The two of them went out tittering. I heard the footsteps and voices of a number of people walking by downstairs. I went into the bathroom and washed my face again, then borrowed a nail clipper and trimmed my nails. For a bathroom that was being shared by two women, its contents were incredibly simple. Aside from some neatly arranged bottles of cleansing cream and lip moisturizer and sunblock, there was almost nothing that could be called cosmetics. When I finished trimming my nails, I made myself some coffee and drank it at the kitchen table, German book open. Stripping down to a t-shirt in the sun-filled kitchen, I had set about memorizing all the forms in a grammar chart when I was struck by an odd feeling. It seemed to me that the longest imaginable distance separated irregular German verb forms from this kitchen table. The two women came back from the farm at 1130 took turns in the shower, and changed into fresh clothes. The three of us went to the dining hall for lunch, then walked to the front gate. This time, the guardhouse had a man on duty. He was sitting at his desk, enjoying a lunch that must have been brought to him from the dining hall. The transistor radio on the shelf was playing a sentimental old pop tune. He waved to us with a friendly hi as we approached, and we helloed him back. Neko explained to him that we were going to walk outside the grounds and return in three hours. Great, he said. You lucked out with the weather. Just stay away from the valley road, though. It got washed out in that big rain. No problem anywhere else. Neko wrote her name and Naoko's in a furlough registry along with the date and time. Enjoy yourselves, said the guard, and take care. Nice guy, I said. He's a little strange up here. Leiko said, touching her head. He had been right about the weather, though. The sky was a fresh-swept blue, with only a trace of white cloud clinging to the dome of heaven like a thin streak of test paint. We walked beside the low stone wall of Ami Hostel for a time, then moved away to climb a steep, narrow trail single file. Leiko led the way, with Naoko in the middle and me bringing up the rear. Leiko climbed with a confident stride of one who knew every stretch of every mountain in the area. We concentrated on walking, with hardly a word among us. Naoko wore blue jeans and a white blouse and carried her jacket in one hand. I watched her long, straight hair swaying right and left, where it met her shoulders. She would glance back at me now and then, smiling when our eyes met. The trail continued upward so long it was almost dizzying. But Neko's pace never slackened. Naoko hurried to keep up with her, wiping the sweat from her face. Not having indulged in such outdoor activities for some time, I found myself running short of breath, I asked Naoko. Maybe once a week, she answered. Having a tough time? Kind of, I said. We're almost there, said Neko. This is about two-thirds of the way. Come on, you're a boy, aren't you? Yeah, but I'm out of shape. Playing with girls all the time, muttered Naoko as if to herself. I wanted to answer her, but I was too winded to speak. Every now and then, red birds with tufts on their heads would flit across our path, brilliant against the blue of the sky. The fields around us were filled with white and blue and yellow flowers, and bees buzzed everywhere. Moving ahead one step at a time, I thought of nothing but the scene passing before my eyes. The slope gave out after another ten minutes, and we entered a level plateau. We rested there, wiping the sweat off, catching our breath, and drinking from our water bottles. 
Reiko found a leaf and used it to make a whistle. The trail entered a gentle downward grade amid tall, waving thickets of plume grass. We continued on for some fifteen minutes before passing through a village. There were no signs of humanity here, and a dozen or so houses were all in varying states of decay. Waist-high grass grew among the houses, and dry, white gobs of pigeon droppings clung to holes in the walls. Only the pillars survived in the case of one collapsed building, while others looked ready to be lived in as soon as he opened the storm shutters. These dead, silent houses pressed against either side of the road as we slipped through. People lived in this village until seven or eight years ago, Neko informed me. This was farmland around here, but they all cleared out. Life was just too hard. They'd be trapped when the snow piled up in the winter, and the soil is not particularly fertile. They could make a better living in the city. What a waste, I said. Some of the houses look perfectly usable. Some hippies tried living here at one point, but they gave up. Couldn't take the winters. A little beyond the village, we came to a big fenced area that seemed to be a pasture. Way over on the other side, I caught sight of a few horses grazing. We followed the fence line, and a big dog came running over to us, tail wagging. It stood up, leaning on Deko, sniffing her face, then jumped playfully on Naoko. I whistled. And it came over to me, licking my hand with its long tongue. Naoko patted the dog's head and explained that the animal belonged to the pasture. I'll bet he's close to twenty, she said. His teeth are so bad he can't eat much of anything hard. He sleeps in front of the shop all day, and he comes running when he hears footsteps. Cheese from her knapsack. Catching its scent, the dog bounded over to her and chomped down on it. We won't be able to see this fellow much longer," said Deko, patting the dog's head. "In the middle of October, they put the horses and cows in trucks and take them down to the barn. The only time they let them graze is the summer, when they open a little coffee house kind of thing for the tourists. The tourists, maybe twenty hikers in a day. Say, how about something to drink? Good idea," I said. The dog led the way to the coffee house, a small white house with a front porch and a faded sign in the shape of a coffee cup hanging from the eaves. He led us up the steps and stretched out on the porch, narrowing his eyes. When we took our places around a table on the porch, a girl with a ponytail and wearing a sweatshirt and white jeans came out and greeted Deko and Naoko like old friends. This is a friend of Naoko's. Said Deko, introducing me. Hi, she said. Hi, I answered. While the three women traded small talk, I stroked the neck of the dog under the table. This was the hard, stringy neck of an old dog. When I scratched the lumpy spots, the dog closed his eyes and sighed with pleasure. What's his name? I asked the girl. Pepe, she said. Hey, Pepe, I said to the dog. But he didn't budge. He's hard of hearing," said the girl. "You have to talk loud, or he can't hear." Pepe! I shouted. The dog opened his eyes and snapped to attention with a bark. "Never mind, Pepe," said the girl. "Sleep more and live longer." Pepe flopped down again at my feet. Naoko and Deko ordered cold glasses of milk, and I asked for a beer. "Let's hear the radio." Said Deko. The girl switched on an amplifier and tuned in an FM station. Blood, sweat, and tears came on with spinning wheel. Deko looked pleased. Now this is what we're here for. We don't have radios in our rooms, so if I don't come here once in a while, I don't have any idea what's playing out there. Do you sleep in this place? I asked the girl. No way, she laughed. I die of loneliness if I spent the night here. The pasture guy drives me into town, and I come out again in the morning. She pointed toward a four-wheel drive truck parked in front of the nearby pasture office. You've got a vacation coming up soon, too, right? Asked Deko. Yeah, we'll be shutting up this place before too long. 
said the girl. Neko offered her a cigarette, and the two had a smoke. I'll miss you, said Neko. I'll be back in May, though, said the girl with a laugh. Cream came on the radio with white room. After a commercial, it was Simon and Garfunkel's Scarborough said Neko when it was over. I saw the movie, I said. Who's in it? Dustin Hoffman? I don't know him, she said with a sad little shake of the head. The world changes like mad, and I don't know what's happening. She asked the girl for a guitar. Sure, said the girl, switching off the radio and bringing out an old guitar. The dog raised its head and sniffed the instrument. You can't eat this, Nickel said with mock sternness. A grass-scented breeze swept over the porch. The mountains lay spread out before us, ridgelines sharp against the sky. It's like a scene from The Sound of Music, I said to Deco as she tuned up. What's that? she asked. She strummed the guitar in search of the opening chord of Scarborough Fair. This was apparently her first attempt at the song, but after a few false starts, she got to where she could play it through without hesitating. She had it down pat the third time, and even started adding a few flourishes. Good ear, she said to me with a wink. I can usually play just about anything if I hear it three times. Softly humming the melody, she did a full rendition of Scarborough Fair. The three of us applauded, and Neko responded with a decorous bow of the head. I used to get more applause for a Mozart concerto, she said. Her milk was on the house if she would play the Beatles' Here Comes the Sun, said the girl. Neko gave her a thumbs up and launched into the song. Hers was not a full voice, and too much smoking had given it a husky edge, but it was lovely, with real presence. I almost felt as if the sun really were coming up again as I sat there listening and drinking beer and looking at the mountains. It was a soft, warm feeling. Neko gave the guitar back and asked for more radio. Then she suggested to Naoko and me that we take an hour and hike around the area. I want to listen to the radio some more and hang out with her. If you come back by three, that should be okay. Is it all right for us to be alone together so long? Well, actually, it's against the rules. But what the hell? I'm not a chaperone, after all. I could use a break. And you came all the way from Tokyo. I'm sure you've got a pile of stuff you want to talk about. Neko lit another cigarette as she spoke. Let's go said Naoko, standing up. I stood and started after her. The dog woke up and followed us a ways, but it soon lost interest and went back to its place on the porch. We strolled down a level road that followed the pasture fence. Naoko would take my hand every now and then or slip her arm under mine. This is kind of like the old days, isn't it? She said. That wasn't the old days, I laughed. It was spring of this year. If that was the old days, ten years ago was like ancient, ancient history, history, said Naoko. But anyhow, sorry about last night. I don't know, I was a bundle of nerves. I really shouldn't have done that after you came here all the way from Tokyo. Never mind, I said. Both of us have a lot of feelings we need to get out in the open. So if you want to take those feelings and smash somebody with them, smash me. Then we can understand each other better. So if you understand me better, what then? You don't get it, do you? I said. It's not a question of what then. Some people get a kick out of reading railroad timetables, and that's all they do all day. Some people make huge model boats out of matchsticks. So what's wrong if there happens to be one guy in the world who enjoys trying to understand you? Kind of like a hobby? She said, amused. Sure, I guess you could call it a hobby. Most normal people would call it friendship or love or something. But if you want to call it a hobby, that's okay too. Tell me, said Naoko. You liked Kizuki too, didn't you? Of course. 
I said. How about Reiko? I like her a lot, I said. She's really nice. How come you always like people like that? People like us, I mean. We're all kind of weird and twisted and drowning. Me and Kizuki and Reiko. Why can't you like more normal people? Because I don't see you like that, I said after giving it some thought. I don't see you or Kizuki or Reiko as twisted in any way. The guys I think of as twisted are out there running around. But we are twisted, said Naoko. I can see that. We walked for a while in silence. The road left the fence and came out to a circular grassy field, ringed with trees as if it were a pond. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night so scared, said Naoko, pressing up against my arm. I'm scared I'll never get better again. I'll always stay twisted like this and grow old and waste away here. I get so chilled, it's like I'm all frozen inside. It's horrible. So cold. I put my arm around her and drew her close. I feel like Kizuki is reaching out for me from the darkness, calling to me. Hey, Naoko, we can't stay apart. When I hear him saying that, do I don't know do? what to do. Well, Don't take this the wrong way now. Okay, I won't. I ask Reiko to hold me. I wake her up and crawl into her bed and let her hold me tight. And I cry. And she strokes me until the ice melts and I'm warm again. Do you think it's sick? No, it's not sick. I wish I could be the one to hold you, though. I said. So hold me. Now. Right here. We sat down on the dry grass of the meadow and put our arms around each other. The tall grass surrounded us, and we could see nothing but the sky and clouds above. I gently lay Naoko down and took her in my arms. She was soft and warm, and her hands reached out for me. We kissed with real feeling. Tell me something, Toru, Naoko whispered in my ear. What's that? I asked. Do you want to sleep with me? Of course I do, I said. Can you wait? Of course I can wait. Before we do it again, I want to get myself a little writer. I want to make myself into a person writer for that hobby of yours. Will you wait for me to do that? Of course I'll wait. Are you hard now? You mean the soles of my feet? Silly? Naoko tittered. If you're asking whether I have an erection, of course I do. Will you do me a favor and stop saying of course? Okay, I'll stop. Is it difficult? What? To be all hard like that. Difficult? I mean... Are you suffering? Well, it's all in how you look at it. Want me to help you get rid of it? With your hand? Uh huh. To tell you the truth, said Naoko, it's been sticking into me ever since we lay down. It hurts. I pulled my hips away. Better? Thanks. You know, I said. What? I wish she would do it. Okay, she said with a nice smile. Then she unzipped my pants and took my stiff penis in her hand. It's warm, she said. She started to move her hand, but I stopped her and unbuttoned her blouse, reaching around to undo her bra strap. I kissed her soft pink nipples. She closed her eyes and slowly started moving her fingers. Hey, you're pretty good at that, I said. Be a good boy and shut up, said Naoko. After I came, I held her in my arms and kissed her again. 
Naoko redid her bra and blouse, and I closed my zipper. Will that make it easier for you to walk? She asked. I owe it all to you. Well then, sir, if it suits you, shall we walk a little farther? By all means. We cut across the meadow, through a stand of trees, and across another meadow. Naoko talked about her dead sister, explaining that although she had hardly said anything about this to anyone, she felt she ought to tell me. She was six years older than me, and our personalities were totally different. But still, we were very close. We never fought, not once. It's true. Of course, with such a big difference in our ages, there was nothing much for us to fight about. Her sister was one of those girls who are tops in everything: a super student, a super athlete, popular, a leader, kind, straightforward. The boys liked her. Her teachers loved her. Her walls were covered with certificates of merit. There's always one girl like that in any public school. I'm not saying this because she's my sister, but she never let any of this spoil her or make her the least bit stuck up or a show off. It's just that, no matter what you gave her to do, she would naturally do it better than anyone else. So when I was little, I decided that I was going to be the sweet little girl. Naoko twirled a frond of plume grass as she spoke. I mean, you know, I grew up hearing everybody talking about how smart she was and how good she was at sports and how popular she was. Of course, I'm going to figure there's no way I could ever compete with her. My face, at least, was a little prettier than hers, so I guess my parents decided they'd bring me up cute. Right from the start, they put me in that kind of school. They dressed me in velvet dresses and frilly blouses, and patent leather shoes, and gave me piano lessons and ballet lessons. This just made my sister even crazier about me, you know. I was her cute little sister. She'd give me these cute little presents and take me everywhere with her and help me with my homework. She even took me along on dates. She was the best big sister anyone could ask for. Nobody knew why she killed herself. The same as with Kizuki, exactly the same. She was seventeen too. And she never gave the slightest hint she was going to commit suicide. She didn't leave a note either. Really, it was exactly the same, don't you think? Everybody said、Sounds、she was、like、too、it. smart, or she read too many books. And she did read a lot. She had tons of books. I read a bunch of them after she died, and it was so sad. They had her comments in the margins and flowers pressed between the pages. And letters from boyfriends, and every time I came across something like that, I'd cry. I cried a lot. Naoko fell silent for a few seconds, twirling the grass again. She was the kind of person who took care of things by herself. She'd never ask anybody for advice or help. It wasn't a matter of pride, I think. She just did what seemed natural to her. My parents were used to this and figured she'd be okay if they left her alone. I would go to my sister for advice, and she was always ready to give it. But she never went to anybody else. She did what needed to be done on her own. She never got angry or moody. This is all true. I mean it. I'm not exaggerating. Most girls, when they have their period or something, will get grumpy and take it out on other people. But she never even did that. Instead of going into a bad mood, she would become very subdued. Maybe once in two or three months, this would happen to her. She'd shut herself up in a room and stay in bed, take off from school, hardly eat a thing, turn the lights off, and space out. She wouldn't be in a bad mood though. When I came home from school, she'd call me into her room and sit me down next to her and ask me about my day. I'd tell her all the little things, like what kinds of games I played with my friends, or what the teacher said, or my test grade, stuff like that. 
She'd take in every detail and make comments and suggestions. But as soon as I left, to play with a friend, say, or go for a ballet lesson, she'd space out again. After two days, she'd snap out of it just like that and go off to school. This kind of thing went on for, I don't know, maybe four years. My parents were worried at first, and I think they went to a doctor for advice. But, I mean, she'd be perfectly fine after the two days went by. So they figured it'd work itself out if they left her alone. She was such a bright, steady girl. After she died, though, I heard my parents talking about a younger brother of my father's who had died long before. He had also been very bright, but he had stayed shut up in the house for four years, from the time he was seventeen until he was twenty-one. And then suddenly one day, he left the house and jumped in front of a train. My father said, Maybe it's in the blood from my side. While Naoko was speaking, her fingers unconsciously teased the tassel of the plume grass, scattering its fibers to the wind. When the shaft was bare, she wound it around her fingers. The one who found my sister dead, she went on. In autumn, when I was in the sixth grade, November, on a dark, rainy day, my sister was a senior in high school at the time. I came home from my piano lesson at six thirty, and my mother was fixing dinner. She told me to tell my sister that dinner was ready. I went upstairs and knocked on her door and yelled, "Dinner's ready!" But there was no answer. Her room was absolutely silent. I thought this was strange, so I knocked again and opened the door and peeked inside. I figured she was probably sleeping. She wasn't in bed, though. She was standing by the window, staring outside, with her neck bent at a kind of angle like this, like she was thinking. The room was dark; the lights were out, and it was hard to see anything. "What are you doing?" I said to her. "Dinner is ready." That's when I noticed that she looked taller than usual. What was going on? I wondered. It was so strange. Did she have high heels on? Was she standing on something? I moved closer and was just about to speak to her again when I saw it. There was a rope above her head. It came straight down from a beam in the ceiling. I mean, it was amazingly straight, like somebody had drawn a line in space with a ruler. My sister had a white blouse on. Yeah, a simple white blouse like this one, and a gray skirt, and her toes were pointing down like a ballerina's. Except there was a space between the tip of her toes and the floor of maybe seven or eight inches. I took in every detail. Her face too. I looked at her face. I couldn't help it. I thought. I've got to go right downstairs and tell my mother. I've got to scream. But my body ignored me. It moved on its own, separately from my conscious mind. It was trying to lower her from the rope while my mind was telling me to hurry downstairs. Of course, there was no way a little girl could have the strength to do such a thing, and so I just stood there, spacing out for maybe five or six minutes. A total blank, like something inside me had died. I just stayed that way, with my sister, in that cold, dark place until my mother came up to see what was going on. Naoko shook her head. For three days after that, I couldn't talk. I just lay in bed like a dead person, eyes wide open and staring into space. I didn't know what was happening. Naoko pressed against my arm. I told you in my letter, didn't I? I'm a far more flawed human being than you realize. My sickness is a lot worse than you think. It has far deeper roots. 
and that's why I want you to go on ahead of me if you can. Don't wait for me. Sleep with other girls if you want to. Don't let thoughts of me hold you back. Just do what you want to do. Otherwise, I might end up taking you with me, and that is the one thing I don't want to do. I don't want to interfere with your life. I don't want to interfere with anybody's life. Like I said before, I want you to come to see me every once in a while and always remember me. That's all I want. All I want, though, I said. You're wasting your life being involved with me. I'm not wasting anything. But I might never recover. Will you wait for me forever? Can you wait ten years, twenty years? You're letting yourself be scared by too many things, I said. The dark, bad dreams, the power of the dead. You have to forget them. I'm sure you'll get well if you do. If I can, said Naoko, shaking her head. If you can get out of this place, will you live with me? I asked. Then I can protect you from the dark and from bad dreams. Then you'd have me instead of Reiko to hold you when things got difficult. Naoko pressed still more firmly against me. That would be wonderful, she said. We got back to the coffee house a little before three. Deco was reading a book and listening to Brahms' second piano concerto on the radio. There was something wonderful about Brahms playing at the edge of a grassy meadow without a sign of people as far as the eye could see. Deco was whistling along with the cello passage opening the third movement. Bachhaus and Bohm, she said. I wore this record out once, a long time ago. Literally. I wore the grooves out listening to every note. I sucked the music right out of it. Naoko and I ordered coffee. Do a lot of talking? asked Deko. Tons, said Naoko. Tell me all about his, uh, you know, later. We didn't do any of that, said Naoko, reddening. Really? Deko asked me. Nothing? Nothing, I said. Boring, she said with a bored look on her face. True, I said, sipping my coffee. The scene in the dining hall was the same as it had been the day before. The mood, the voices, the faces. Only the menu had changed. The balding man in white, who yesterday had been talking about the secretion of gastric juices under weightless conditions, joined the three of us at our table, and talked for a long time about the correlation of brain size to intelligence. As we ate our soybean hamburger steaks, we heard all about the volume of Bismarck's brain and Napoleon's. He pushed his plate aside and used a ballpoint pen and notepaper to draw sketches of brains. He would start to draw... declare, no, that's not quite it, and start a new one. This happened any number of times. When he was through, he carefully put the remaining notepaper away in a pocket of his white jacket and slipped the pen into his breast pocket. He had a total of three pens in that pocket, along with pencils and a ruler. When he was through eating, he repeated what he had told me the day before. The winters here are nice. Make sure you come back when it's winter. And left the dining hall. Am I a doctor or a patient? I asked Deco. Which do you think? I really can't tell. In either case, he doesn't seem all that normal. He's a doctor, said Naoko. Dr. Miyata. Yeah, said Deco. But I bet he's the craziest one here. Mr. Omura, the gatekeeper, is pretty crazy too, answered Naoko. True. said Deko, nodding as she stabbed her broccoli. He does these wild calisthenics every morning, screaming nonsense at the top of his lungs. And before you came, Naoko, there was a girl in the business office, Miss Kinoshita, who tried to kill herself. And last year, they fired a male nurse, Tokushima, who had a terrible drinking problem. 
Sounds like patients and staff could trade places, I said. Right on, said Deco, waving her fork in the air. I guess you're finally starting to figure out how things work here. I guess. What makes us most normal, said Deco, is knowing that we're not normal. Back in the room, Naoko and I played cards while Deco practiced Bach on her guitar. What time are you leaving tomorrow? Deco asked me, taking a break and lighting a cigarette. Right after breakfast, I said. The bus comes after nine. That way I can get back in time for tomorrow night's work. Too bad. It'd be nice if you could stay longer. If I hung around too long, I might end up living here, I said, laughing. Maybe so, Deiko said. Then to Naoko, she said, Oh, yeah, I've got to go get some grapes at Oka's. I totally forgot. Want me to go with you? asked Naoko. How about letting me borrow your young Mr. Watanabe here? Fine, said Naoko. Good. Let's just the two of us go for another nighttime stroll, said Deiko, taking my hand. We were almost there yesterday. Let's go all the way tonight. Fine, said Naoko, tittering. Do what you like. The night air was cool. Deiko wore a pale blue cardigan over her shirt and walked with her hands shoved in the pockets of her jeans. Looking up at the sky, she sniffed the breeze like a dog. Smells like rain, she said. I tried sniffing too, but couldn't smell anything. True, there were lots of clouds in the sky obscuring the moon. If you stay here long enough, you can pretty much tell the weather by the smell of the air, said Deco. We entered the wooded area where the staff houses stood. Deco told me to wait a minute and walked over to the front door of one house where she rang the bell. A woman came to the door, no doubt the lady of the house, and stood there chatting and chuckling with Deco. Then she ducked inside and came back with a large plastic bag. Deco thanked her and said good night before returning to the spot where I opened the bag. The bag held a huge pile of grapes in clusters. Do you like grapes? I sure do. She handed me the topmost bunch. It's okay to eat them, they're washed. We walked along eating grapes and spitting the skins and seeds on the ground. The fruit was fresh and delicious. I give their boy piano lessons once in a while, and they give me different stuff. The wine we had was from them. I sometimes ask them to do a little shopping for me in town. I'd like to hear the rest of the story you were telling me yesterday, I said. Fine, said Deco. But if we keep coming home late, Naoko might start getting suspicious. I'm willing to risk it. Okay, then. I want a roof, though. It's a little chilly tonight. She turned left as we approached the tennis courts. We went down a narrow stairway and came out to a spot where several storehouses stood like a block of row houses. Deco opened the door of the nearest one, stepped in, and turned on the lights. Come in, she said. It's a nothing kind of place, though. The storehouse contained neat rows of cross-country skis, boots, and poles, and on the floor were piled snow removal equipment and bags of rock salt. I used to come here all the time for guitar practice, when I wanted to be alone. Nice and cozy, isn't it? Deco sat on the bags of rock salt and invited me to sit next to her. I did as I was told. Not much ventilation here, but mind if I smoke? Sure, go ahead, I said. This is one habit I can't seem to break, she said with a frown. But she lit up with obvious enjoyment. Not many people enjoy tobacco as much as Deco did. I ate my grapes, carefully peeling them one at a time and tossing the skins and seeds into a tin that served as a wastebasket. Now, let's see... How far did we get last night? Deco asked. It was a dark and stormy night, and you were climbing the steep cliff to grab the bird's nest. You're amazing the way you can joke around with such a straight face, said Deco. Let's see. 
I think I had gotten to where I was giving piano lessons to the girl every Saturday morning. That's it. Assuming you can divide everybody in the world into two groups, those who are good at teaching things to people and those who are not. I pretty much belong to the first group, said Deco. I never thought so when I was young, and I guess I didn't want to think of myself that way. But I realized it was true when I had attained a degree of self-knowledge after I had reached a certain age. I'm good at teaching people things, really good. I have a lot more I'll patience for others than I have for myself, and I'm much better at bringing out the best in others than in myself. That's just the kind of person I am. I'm the scratchy stuff on the side of the matchbox, but that's fine with me. I don't mind at all. Better to be a first-class matchbox than a second-class match. I got this clear in my own mind, I'd say, after I started teaching the girl. I had taught a few others when I was younger, strictly as a sideline, without seeing this about myself. It was only after I started teaching her that I started thinking of myself that way. Hey, I'm good at teaching people. That's how well the lessons went. As I said yesterday, the girl was nothing special when it came to technique, and there was no question of her becoming a professional musician, so I could take it easy. Plus, she was going to the kind of girl's school where anybody with half decent grades automatically got into college, which meant she didn't have to kill herself studying, and her mother was all for taking it easy with the lessons too. So I didn't push her to do anything. I knew the first time I met her that she was the kind of girl you couldn't push to do anything, that she was the kind of child who would be all sweetness and say yes, yes, and absolutely refuse to do anything she didn't want to do. So the first thing I did was let her play a piece the way she wanted to, one hundred percent her own way. Then I would play the same piece all different ways for her. And the two of us would discuss which way was better or which way she liked better. Then I'd have her play the piece again, and her performance would be ten times better than the first time through. She would see for herself what worked best, and bring those features into her own playing. Deco paused for a moment, looking at the glowing end of her cigarette. I went on eating my grapes without a word. I know I have a pretty good sense for music, but she was better than me. I used to think it was such a waste. I thought, if only she had started out with a good teacher and gotten the proper training, she'd be so much further along. But I was wrong about that. She was not the kind of child who could stand proper training. There just happen to be people like that. They're blessed with this marvelous talent. But they can't make the effort to systematize it. They end up squandering it in little bits and pieces. I've seen my share of people like that. At first, you think they're amazing, like they can sight read some terrifically difficult piece and do a damn good job playing it all the way through. You see them do it, and you're overwhelmed. You think, I could never do that in a million years. But that's as far as they go. They can't take it any further, and why not? Because they won't put in the effort. Because they haven't had the discipline pounded into them, they've been spoiled. They have just enough talent so they've been able to play things well without any effort, and they've had people telling them how great they are from the time they're little. So hard work looks stupid to them. They'll take some piece another kid has to work on for three weeks and polish it off in half the time, so the teacher figures they've put enough into it and lets them go to the next thing. And they do that in half the time and go on to the next piece. They never find out what it means to be hammered by the teacher. They lose out on a certain element required for character building. It's a tragedy. I myself had tendencies like that. But fortunately, I had a very tough teacher, so I kept them in check. It was a joy to teach her, like driving down the highway in a high-powered sports car that responds to the slightest touch, maybe responds too quickly sometimes. The trick to teaching children like that is not to praise them too much. They're so used to praise; it doesn't mean anything to them. 
You've got to dole it out wisely, and you can't force anything on them. You have to let them choose for themselves, and you don't let them rush ahead from one thing to the next. You make them stop and think. But that's about it. If you do those things, you'll get good results. Rachel dropped her cigarette butt on the floor and stamped it out. Then she took a deep breath, as if to calm her emotions. When her lessons ended, we'd have tea and chat. Sometimes I'd show her certain jazz piano styles, like "This Is Bud Powell" or "This Is Thelonious Monk." But mostly, she talked. And what a talker she was! She could draw you right in. As I told you yesterday, I think most of what she said was made up, but it was interesting. She was a keen observer, a precise user of language, sharp-tongued and funny. She could stir your emotions. Yes, really, that's what she was so good at: stirring people's emotions, moving you. And she knew she had this power. She tried to use it as skillfully and effectively as possible. She could make you feel whatever she wanted—angry or sad or sympathetic or disappointed or happy. She would manipulate people's emotions for no other reason than to test her own powers. Of course, I only realized this later. At the time, I had no idea what she was doing to me. Rachel shook her head and ate a few grapes. It was a sickness," she said. The girl was sick. She was like the rotten apple that ruins all the other apples, and no one could cure her. She'll have that sickness until the day she dies. In that sense, she was a sad little creature. I would have pitied her too if I hadn't been one of her victims. I would have seen her as a victim. Deco ate a few more grapes. She seemed to be thinking of how best to go on with her story. Well, anyhow, I enjoyed her for a good six months. Sometimes I'd find something she said a little surprising or odd, or she'd be talking, and I'd have this rush of horror to realize that the intensity of her hatred for some person went way beyond reason. Or it would occur to me that she was just way too clever, and I'd wonder what she was really thinking. But after all, everybody has their flaws, right? And finally, what business was it of mine to question her personality or character? I was just her piano teacher. All I had to care about was whether she practiced or not. And besides, the truth of the matter is that I liked her. I liked her a lot. I was careful not to tell her anything too personal about myself. I just had this instinctive sense I'd better avoid talking about such things. She asked me hundreds of questions. She was dying to know more about me, but I told her only the most harmless kind of stuff, like things about my girlhood or where I'd gone to school, stuff like that. She said she wanted to know more about me, but I told her there was nothing to tell. I'd had a boring life. I had an ordinary husband, an ordinary child, and a ton of housework. But I like you so much, she'd say. And look me right in the eye in this clingy sort of way. It sent a thrill through me when she did that—a nice thrill. But even so, I never told her more than I had to. And then one day, a day in May, I think it was, in the middle of her lesson, she said she felt sick. I saw she was pale and sweating, and asked if she wanted to go home. But she said she thought she'd feel better if she could just lie down a while. So I took her, almost carried her, to the bedroom. We had such a small sofa; the bed was the only place she could lie down. She apologized for being a bother, but I assured her it was no bother and asked if she wanted anything to drink. She said no; she just wanted me to stay near her a while, which I said I'd be glad to do. A few minutes later, she asked me to rub her back. She sounded as if she was really suffering, and she was sweating like crazy. So I started to give her a good massage. Then she apologized and asked me if I'd mind taking off her bra. It was hurting her, so I don't know. I did it. She was wearing a skin-tight blouse, and I had to unbutton that and reach behind and undo the bra hooks. 
She had big breasts for a thirteen-year-old, twice as big as mine. And she wasn't wearing any starter bra, but a real adult model, an expensive one. Of course, I'm not paying all that much attention at the time, and like an idiot, I just kept on rubbing her back. She keeps apologizing in this pitiful voice, like she's really sorry, and I keep telling her it's okay, it's okay. Nick will tap the ashes from her next cigarette to the floor. By then, I had stopped eating grapes and was giving all my attention to her story. After a while, she starts sobbing. What's wrong? I ask her. Nothing, she says. It's obviously not nothing, I say. Tell me the truth. What's bothering you? So she says, I just get like this sometimes. I don't know what to do. I'm so lonely and sad, and I can't talk to anybody, and nobody cares about me. And it hurts so much. I just get like this. I can't sleep at night, and I don't feel like eating. And coming here for my lesson is the、oh, only thing I have to look forward. You can to. talk to me. Tell me why this happens to you. Things are not going well at home. She says, she can't love her parents, and they don't love her. Her father is seeing another woman and hardly ever comes home, and that makes her mother half crazy, and she takes it out on the girl. She beats her almost every day, and she hates to go home. So now the girl is really wailing, and her eyes are full of tears. Those beautiful eyes of hers. The sight is enough to make a god blubber. So I tell her, if it's so terrible to go home, she can come to my place any time she likes. When she hears that, the girl throws her arms around me and says, "Oh, I'm so sorry, but if I didn't have you, I wouldn't know what to do." Please don't turn your back on me. If you did that, I'd have nowhere to go. So I don't know. I hold her head against me, and I'm caressing her and saying, "There, there." And she's got her arms around me, and she's stroking my back. And soon, I'm starting to feel very strange. My whole body is kind of hot. I mean, here's this picture-perfect, beautiful girl, and I'm on the bed with her, and we're hugging. And her hands are caressing my back in this incredibly sensual way that my own husband couldn't begin to match, and I feel all the screws coming loose in my body every time she touches me. And before I know it, she's got my blouse and bra off, and she's stroking my breasts. So that's when it finally hits me that she's an absolute dyed-in-the-wool lesbian. This had happened to me once before in high school. One of the upper class girls. So then I tell her to stop. Oh please, she says, just a little more. I'm so lonely. I'm so lonely. Please believe me. You're the only one I have. Oh please, don't turn your back on me. And she takes my hand and puts it on her breast, her very nicely shaped breast. And sure, I'm a woman, but this electric something goes through me when my hand makes contact. I have no idea what to do. I just keep repeating, "No, no, 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 no!" Like an idiot. I'm like paralyzed. I can't move. I had managed okay to push the girl away in high school, but now I can't do a thing. My body won't take orders. She's holding my right hand against her with her left hand, and she's kissing and licking my nipples. And her right hand is caressing my back and side and bottom. So here I am in the bedroom with the curtains closed, and a thirteen-year-old girl has me practically naked. She's been taking my clothes off somehow all along, and touching me all over, and I'm writhing with the pleasure of it. Looking back on it now, it seems incredible. I mean, it's crazy, don't you think? But at the time. It was like she had cast a spell on me. Take a puff on a cigarette. You know, this is the first time I've ever told a man about this," she said, looking at me. "I'm telling it to you because I think I ought to, but I'm finding it awfully embarrassing." "I'm sorry," I said, because I didn't know what else to say. This went on for a while, and then her right hand started to move down. And she touched me through my panties. By then, I was absolutely soaking wet. 
I'm ashamed to say it, but I've never been so wet before or since. I had always thought of myself as kind of indifferent to sex, so I was astounded to be getting so worked up. So then she puts these slim, soft fingers of hers inside my panties, and, well, you know, I can't bring myself to put it into words. I mean, it was totally different from when a man puts his clumsy hands on you there. It was amazing. Really. Like feathers or down. I thought all the fuses in my head were going to pop. Still, somewhere in my fogged-over brain, the thought occurred to me that I had to put a stop to this. If I let it happen once, I'd never stop. And if I had to carry around a secret like that inside me, my head was going to get completely messed up again. I thought about my daughter, too. What if she saw me like this? She was supposed to be at my parents' house until three on Saturdays. But what if something happened and she came home unexpectedly? This helped me to gather my strength and raise myself on the bed. Stop it now, please, stop, I shouted. But she wouldn't stop. Instead, she yanked my panties down and started using her tongue. I had rarely let even my husband do that. I found it so embarrassing. But now I had a 13-year-old girl licking me all over down there. I just gave up. All I could do was cry. And it was absolutely paradise. Stop it, I yelled one more time and smacked her on the side of the face as hard as I could. Finally, she stopped and raised herself up and looked into my eyes. The two of us were stark naked, on our knees in bed, staring at each other. She was thirteen. I was thirty-one. But, I don't know, looking at that body of hers, I felt totally overwhelmed. The image is still vivid in my mind. I could hardly believe I was looking at the body of a 13-year-old girl, and I still can't believe it. By comparison, what I had for a body was enough to make you cry, believe me. There was nothing I could say, and so I said nothing, she says to me. You like it this way, don't you? I knew you would the first time I met you. I know you like it. It's way better than doing it with a man, isn't it? Look how wet you got. I can make you feel even better if you'll let me. It's true. I can make you feel like your body's melting away. You want me to do it, don't you? And she was right. Doing this with her was much better than doing it with my husband. And I did want her to do it even more. But I couldn't let it happen. Let's do this once a week, she said. Just once a week. Nobody will find out. It'll be our little secret. But I got out of bed and put on my robe and told her to leave and never come back. She just looked at me. Her eyes were absolutely flat. I had never seen them that way before. It was as if they had been painted on cardboard. They had no depth. After she stared at me for a while, she gathered up her clothing without a word, and as slowly as she could, as if she was making a show of it, she put on each piece, one at a time. Then she went back into the room where the piano was and took a brush from her bag. She brushed her hair and wiped the blood from her lips with a handkerchief, put on her shoes, and went out. As she was leaving, she said, You're a lesbian, you know. It's true. You may try to hide it, but you'll be a lesbian until the day you die. Is it true? I asked. Neiko curved her lips and thought for a while. Well, it is and it isn't. I definitely felt better with her than with my husband. That's a fact. I had a time there when I really agonized over the question. Maybe I really was a lesbian and just hadn't noticed until then. But I don't think so anymore. Which is not to say I don't have the tendencies. I probably do have them. But I'm not a lesbian in the proper sense of the term. I never feel desire when I look at a woman. Know what I mean? I nodded. 
Certain kinds of girls, though, do respond to me, and I can feel it when that happens. Those are the only times it comes out in me. I can hold Naoko in my arms, though, and feel nothing special. We go around in the apartment practically naked when the weather is hot, and we take baths together, sometimes even sleep in the same bed, but nothing happens. I don't feel a thing. I can see that she has a beautiful body, but that's all. Actually, Naoko and I played a game once. We made believe we were lesbians. Want to hear about it? What sure. The story tell I just me. told you. We tell each other everything, you know. Naoko tried an experiment. The two of us got undressed, and she tried caressing me, but it didn't work at all. It just tickled. I thought I was going to die laughing. Just thinking about it makes me itchy. She was so clumsy. I'll bet you're glad to hear that. Yes, I am, to tell the truth. Well, anyway, that's about it," said Deko, scratching near an eyebrow with the tip of her little finger. After the girl left my house, I found a chair and sat there, spacing out for a while, wondering what to do. I could hear the dull beating of my heart from deep inside my body. My arms and legs seemed to weigh a ton, and my mouth felt as if I had eaten a moth or something. It was so dry. I dragged myself to the bathtub, though, knowing my daughter would be back soon. I wanted to clean those places where the girl had touched and licked me. I scrubbed myself with soap, over and over, but I couldn't seem to get rid of the slimy feeling she had left behind. I knew I was probably imagining it, but that didn't help. That night, I asked my husband to make love to me, kind of as a way to get rid of the defilement. Of course, I didn't tell him anything. I couldn't. All I said to him was that I wanted him to take it slow, to give it more time than usual. And he did. He really concentrated on every little detail. He really took a long, long time. And the way I came that night, oh yes, it was nothing I had ever experienced before, never once in all our marriage. And why do you think that was? Because the touch of that girl's fingers was still there in my body. That's all it was. Oh man, is this embarrassing? Look, I'm sweating. I can't believe I'm saying these things. He made love to me. I came. Deko smiled. Her lips curved again. But even this didn't help. Two days went by. Three. And her touch was still there, and her last words seemed to keep echoing and echoing in my head. She didn't come to my house the following Saturday. My heart was pounding all day long while I waited, wondering what I would do if she showed up. I couldn't concentrate on anything. She never did come, though. Of course, she was a proud young thing, and she had failed with me in the end. She didn't come the next week either, nor the week after that, and soon a month went by. I figured that I would be able to forget about what had happened when enough time went by, but I couldn't forget. When I was alone in the house, I would feel her presence, and my nerves would be on edge. I couldn't play the piano, I couldn't think, I couldn't do anything during that first month. And then one day I realized that something was wrong whenever I left the house. The people in the neighborhood were looking at me in a strange new way. There was a new distance in their eyes. They were as polite as ever with their greetings, but there was something different in their tone of voice and in their behavior toward me. The woman next door, who used to pay me an occasional visit, seemed to be avoiding me. I tried not to let these things bother me, though. Start noticing things like that, and you've got the first signs of illness. Norwegian This Wood. ends disc six. disc seven. Then one day, I had a visit from another housewife I was on friendly terms with. We were the same age, and she was the daughter of a friend of my mother's, and her child went to the same kindergarten as mine. 
so we were fairly close. She just showed up one day and asked me if I knew about a terrible rumor that was going around about me. I said I did not. What kind of rumor, I asked. I almost can't say it. It's so awful, she said. Well, you've gone this far. You have to tell me the rest. Still, she resisted telling me. But I finally got it all out of her. I mean, her whole purpose in coming to see me was to tell me what she had heard. So, of course, she was going to spit it out eventually. According to her, people were saying that I was a card-carrying lesbian and had been in and out of mental hospitals for it. They said that I had stripped the clothes off my piano pupil and tried to do things to her. And when she had resisted, I had smacked her so hard her face swelled up. They had turned the story on its head, of course, which is bad enough. But what really shocked me was that people knew I had been hospitalized. My friend said she was telling everyone that she had known me forever and that I was not like that. But the girl's parents believed her version and were spreading it around the neighborhood. In addition, they had investigated my background and found that I had a history of mental problems. The way my friend heard it, the girl had come home from her lesson one day, that day, of course, with her face all bloated, her lips split and bloody, buttons missing from her blouse, and even her underwear torn. Can you believe it? She had done all this to back up her story, of course, which her mother had to drag out of her. I can just see her doing it, putting blood on her blouse, tearing buttons off, ripping the lace on her bra, making herself cry until her eyes were red, messing up her hair, telling her mother a bucket of lies. Not that I'm blaming people for believing her. I would have believed her too, this beautiful doll with the devil's tongue. She comes home crying. She refuses to talk because it's too embarrassing. But then she spills it out. Of course people are going to believe her. And to make matters worse, it's true. I do have a history of hospitalization for mental problems. I did smack her in the face as hard as I could. Who's going to believe me? Maybe my husband is all. A few more days went by while I wrestled with the question of whether to tell him or not. But when I did, he believed me. Of course. I told him everything that had happened that day. The kind of lesbian thing she did to me. The way I smacked her in the face. Of course, I didn't tell him what I had felt. There's no way I could have told him that. So anyway, he got furious and insisted that he was going to go straight to the girl's family. He said, You're a married woman after all. You're married to me. And you're a mother. There's no way you're a lesbian. What a go. goddamn joke. All he could do was make things worse. Really, I knew. I knew she was sick. I had seen hundreds of sick people, so I knew. The girl was rotten inside. Peel off a layer of that beautiful skin, and you'd find nothing but rotten flesh. I know it's a terrible thing to say, but it's true. And I knew that ordinary people could never know the truth about her. That there was no way we could win. She was an expert at manipulating the emotions of the adults around her. And we had nothing to prove our case. First of all, who's going to believe that a 13-year-old girl set a homosexual trap for a woman in her 30s? No matter what we said, people would believe what they wanted to believe. The more we struggled, the more vulnerable we'd be. There was only one thing for us to do, I said. We had to move. If I stayed in that neighborhood any longer, the stress would get to me. My mind would snap again. It was happening already. We had to get out of there, go someplace far away where nobody knew me. My husband was not ready to go, though. It hadn't dawned on him yet how critical I was. And the timing was terrible. He was loving his work, and he had finally succeeded in settling us into our own house. We lived in a little prefab. And our daughter was comfortable in her kindergarten. Wait a minute, he said. We can't just pick up and move. I can't find a job just like that. We'd have to sell the house, and we'd have to find another kindergarten. It'll take two months, at least. I can't wait two months, I told him. 
This is going to finish me off once and for all. I'm not kidding. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about. The symptoms were starting already. My ears were ringing, and I was hearing things, and I couldn't sleep. So he suggested that I leave first, go somewhere by myself, and he would follow after he had taken care of what needed to be done. No, I said. I don't want to go anywhere alone. I'll fall apart if I don't have you. I need you. Please don't leave me alone. He held me and pleaded with me to hang on a little longer. Just a month, he said. He would take care of everything, leave his job, sell the house, make arrangements for kindergarten, find a new job. There might be a position he could take in Australia, he said. He just wanted me to wait one month and everything would be okay. I couldn't say anything more to that. If I tried to object, it would only isolate me even more. Deco sighed and looked at the ceiling light. For a month, though. One day, it happened again. Snap. And this time it was really bad. I took sleeping pills and turned on the gas. I woke up in a hospital bed and it was all over. It took a few months before I had calmed down enough to think. And then I asked my husband to divorce me. I told him it would be the best thing for him and for our daughter. He said he had no intention of divorcing me. We can make a new start, he said. We can go someplace new, just the three of us, and begin all over again. It's too late, I told him. Everything ended when you asked me to wait a month. If you really wanted to start again, you shouldn't have said that to me. Now, no matter where we go, no matter how far away we move, the same thing will happen all over again. And I'll ask you for the same thing and make you suffer. I don't want to do that anymore. And so we divorced, or should I say, I divorced him. He married again two years ago, though. I'm still glad I made him leave me, really. I knew I'd be like this for the rest of my life, and I didn't want to drag anyone down with me. I didn't want to force anyone to live in constant fear that I might lose my mind at any moment. He had been wonderful to me. An ideal husband, faithful, strong, and patient. Someone I could put my complete trust in. He had done everything he could to heal me. And I had done everything I could to be healed both for his sake and for our daughter's sake. And I had believed in my recovery. I was happy for six years from the time we were married. He got me 99% of the way there. But the other 1% went crazy. Snap. Everything we had built up came crashing down. In one split second, everything turned into nothing. And that girl was the one who did it. Deco collected the cigarette butts she had crushed underfoot and tossed them into the tin can. It's a terrible story. We worked so hard, so hard, building our world one brick at a time. And when it fell apart, it happened just like that. Everything was gone before you knew it. Deco stood up and thrust her hands in her pants pockets. Let's go back. It's late. The sky was darker the cloud cover thicker than before, the moon invisible. Now I realized, like Deco, I could smell the rain. And with it mixed the fresh smell of the grapes in the bag I was holding in my hand. That's why I can't leave this place, she said. I'm afraid to leave and get involved with the outside world. I'm afraid to meet new people and feel new feelings. I understand, I said. But I think you can do it. I think you can go outside and make it. Deco smiled, but now she didn't say a thing. was on the sofa with a book. She had her legs crossed, and she pressed her hand against her temple as she read. Her fingers almost seemed to be touching and testing each word that entered her head. Scattered drops of rain were beginning to tap on the roof. The lamplight enveloped Naoko, hovering around her like fine dust. After my long talk with Deko, Naoko's youthfulness struck me in a whole new way. Sorry we're so late, said Deko, patting Naoko's head. Enjoy yourselves? asked Naoko, looking up. Of course, 
said Deko. Doing what? Naoko asked me. Just the two of you. Not at liberty to say, miss, I answered. Naoko chuckled and set her book down. Then the three of us ate grapes to the sound of the rain. When it's raining like this, said Naoko, it feels as if we're the only ones in the world. I wish it would just keep raining so the three of us could stay together. Oh, sure, said Deko. And while the two of you are going at it, I'm supposed to be fanning you or playing background music on my guitar like some dumb slave. No thanks. Oh, I'd let you have him once in a while, said Naoko laughing. Okay then, count me in, said Deko. Come on, rain, pour down. The rain did pour down and kept pouring. Thunder shook the place from time to time. When we finished the grapes, Deko went back to her cigarettes and pulled the guitar out from under her bed and started to play. First, Desafinado and the girl from Ipanema, then some Bacharach and a few Lennon and McCartney songs. Deko and I sipped wine again, and when that was gone, we shared the brandy that was left in my flask. A warm, close mood took hold as the three of us talked into the night, and I began to wish, with Naoko, that the rain would keep on falling. Will you come to see me again? Naoko asked, looking at me. Of course I will, I said. And will you write? Every week. And will you add a few lines for me? Deko asked. That I will, I said. I'd be glad to. At eleven o'clock, Deko folded the sofa down and made a bed for me, as she had the night before. We said good night and turned out the lights and went to bed. Unable to sleep, I took the magic mountain and a flashlight from my knapsack and read for a while. Just before midnight, the bedroom door edged open, and Naoko came and crawled in next to me. Unlike the night before, Naoko was the usual Naoko. Her eyes were in focus, her movements brisk. Bringing her mouth to my ear, she whispered, "I don't know. I can't either. I can't sleep." I said, setting my book down and turning out the flashlight. I took her in my arms and kissed her. The darkness and the sound of the rain enfolded us. How about Deko? Don't worry, she's sound asleep, and when she sleeps, she sleeps. Then Naoko asked, "Will you really come to see me again?" I will for sure. Even if I can't do anything for you, I nodded in the darkness. I could feel the full shape of her breasts against me. I traced the outline of her body through her gown with the flat of my hand, from shoulder to back to hips. I slid my hand again and again, driving the line and the softness of her body into my brain. After we had been in this gentle embrace for a while, Naoko touched her lips to my forehead, and slipped out of bed. I could see her pale blue gown flash in the darkness like a fish. Goodbye, she called in a tiny voice. Listening to the rain, I dropped into a gentle sleep. It was still raining the following morning. A fine, almost invisible autumn rain, unlike the previous night's downpour. You knew it was raining only because of the ripples on puddles, and the sound of dripping from the eaves. I woke to see a milky white mist enclosing the window. But as the sun rose, a breeze carried the mist away, and the surrounding woods and hills began to emerge. As we had done the day before. The three of us ate breakfast and headed out to service the birdhouse. Naoko and Deko wore yellow vinyl rain capes with hoods. I put on a sweater and a waterproof windbreaker. The outside air was damp and chilly. The birds too seemed to be avoiding the rain, huddled together at the back of the cage. Gets cold here when it rains, doesn't it? I said to Deko. Now every time it rains, it'll be a little colder until it turns to snow. She said. The clouds from the Sea of Japan dump tons of snow when they pass through here. What do you do with the birds in winter? 
Bring them inside, of course. What are we supposed to do? Dig them out of the snow in spring, all frozen? We defrost them and bring them back to life and yell, Okay, everybody, come and get it. I poked the wire mesh and the parrot flapped its wings and screamed, Shit ahead! Thank you! Crazy! Now that one I'd like to freeze, Naoko said with a melancholy look. I really think I will go crazy if I have to hear that every morning. After cleaning the birdhouse, we went back to the apartment. While I packed my things, the women put their farm gear on. We left the building together and parted a short way beyond the tennis court. They turned right, and I continued straight ahead. We called goodbye to each other, and I promised I would come again. Naoko gave a little smile and disappeared around the corner. I a number of people on my way to the gate, all of them wearing the same yellow rain capes that Naoko and Deko had on, all with hoods up. Colors shone with exceptional clarity in the rain. The ground was a deep black, the pine branches a brilliant green, the people wrapped in yellow, looking like special spirits that were allowed to wander over the earth on rainy mornings only. They floated over the earth in silence, carrying farm tools and baskets and some kind of sack. The gatekeeper remembered my name and marked it on the list of visitors when I went out. I see you're from Tokyo, the old fellow said. I went there once, just once. They serve great pork. They do? I asked, uncertain how to answer him. I didn't like much of what I ate in Tokyo, but the pork was delicious. I guess they've got some special way of raising them, huh? I said I didn't know. It was the first time I'd heard of it. When was that, by the way, when you went to Tokyo? Hmm, let's see, he said, cocking his head. Was it the time His Majesty the Crown Prince got married? My son was in Tokyo and said I ought to see the place at least once. That time. 1959. Oh, well then, sure, pork must have been good in Tokyo back then, I said. How about these days? he asked. I wasn't sure, I said, but I hadn't heard anything special about it. This seemed to disappoint him somewhat. He gave every sign of wanting to continue our conversation, but I told him I had to catch a bus and started walking in the direction of the road. Patches of fog remained floating on the road where it skirted the stream, but the breeze carried them over to the steep flanks of a nearby mountain. Every now and then, as I walked along, I would stop and turn and heave a sigh for no particular reason. I felt almost as if I had come to a planet where the gravity was a little different. Yes, of course, I told myself, feeling sad. I was in the outside world now. Back at the dorm by 4.30, I changed right away and left for the record shop in Shinjuku to put in my hours. I minded the store from 6 o'clock to 10.30 and sold a few records. But mainly, I sat there in a daze, watching the incredible variety of people streaming by outside. There were families and couples and drunks and gangsters and lively-looking girls in short skirts and bearded hippies and bar hostesses and some indefinable types. Whenever I put on hard rock, hippies and runaway kids would gather outside to dance and sniff paint thinner or just sit on the ground doing nothing in particular. And when I put on Tony Bennett, they would disappear. Was a shop where a middle-aged, sleepy-eyed guy sold adult toys. I couldn't imagine why anyone would want the kind of sex paraphernalia he had there. But he seemed to do a lot of business. In the alley diagonally across from the record store, I saw a drunken student vomiting. In the game center across from us at another angle, the cook from a local eatery was killing his break time with a game of bingo that took cash bets. Beneath the eaves of a shop that had clothes for the night, a dark-faced homeless guy was crouching, motionless. A girl with pale pink lipstick who couldn't have been more than junior high school age came in and asked me to play the Rolling Stones' Jumpin' Jack Flash. When I found the disc and put it on for her, she started snapping her fingers to the rhythm and shaking her hips as she danced around the shop. Then she asked me for a cigarette. I gave her one of the managers, which she smoked with obvious pleasure, and when the record ended, 
She left the shop without so much as a thank you. Every 15 minutes or so, I would hear the siren of an ambulance or cop car. Three drunken company employees in suits and ties came by, laughing at the tops of their voices every time they yelled, Piece of ass! at a pretty, long-haired girl in a telephone booth. The more I watched, the more mixed up my head became. What the hell was this all about, I wondered. What could it possibly mean? The manager came back from dinner and said to me, Hey, know what, Watanabe? Night before last, I made it with the boutique chick. For some time now, he had had his eye on the girl who worked in a nearby boutique, and every once in a while he would take a record from the shop as a gift for her. Good for you, I said to him, whereupon he told me every last detail of his conquest. If you really want to make a chick, here's what you got to do, he began, very pleased with himself. First, you got to give her presents. Then you got to get her drunk. I mean, really drunk. Then you just got to do it. It's easy. See what I mean? Head mixed up as ever, I boarded the commuter train and went back to my dorm. Closing the curtains, I doused the lights, stretched out in bed, and felt as if Naoko might come crawling in beside me at any moment. With my eyes closed, I could feel the soft swell of her breasts on my chest, hear her whispering to me, and feel the outline of her body in my hands. In the darkness... I returned to that small world of hers. I smelled the meadow grass, heard the rain at night. I thought of her naked, as I had seen her in the moonlight, and pictured her cleaning the birdhouse and caring for the vegetables with that soft, beautiful body of hers wrapped in the yellow rain cape. Clutching my erection, I thought of Naoko until I came. This seemed to clear my brain somewhat, but it didn't help me sleep. I felt exhausted, even desperate for sleep, but it simply refused to cooperate. I got out of bed and stood at the window, my unfocused eyes wandering out toward the flagpole. Without the national flag attached to it, the pole looked like a gigantic white bone thrusting up into the darkness of night. What was Naoko doing now, I wondered. Of course, she must be sleeping sleeping deeply, wrapped in the darkness of that strange little world of hers. Let her be spared from anguished dreams, I found myself hoping. Chapter 7 In P.E. class the next morning, Thursday, I swam several lengths of the 50-meter pool. The hard exercise cleared my head somewhat and gave me an appetite. After downing a good-sized lunch at a student eatery known for its good-sized lunches, I was headed for the literature department library to do some research when I bumped into Midori Kobayashi. She had someone with her, a petite girl with glasses, but when she spotted me, she approached me alone. Where are you going? she asked. Lit library, I said. Why don't you forget it and come have lunch with me? I already ate. So what? Eat again. We ended up going to a nearby cafe where she had a plate of curry and I had a cup of coffee. She wore a white, long-sleeved shirt under a yellow woolen vest with a fish knitted into the design, a narrow gold necklace, and a Disney watch. She seemed to love the curry and drank three glasses of water with it. "'Where have you been all this time?' Midori asked. "'I don't know how many times I called. "'Was there something you wanted to talk to me about?' Nothing special. I just called. I see. You see what? Nothing. Just, I see, I said. Any fires lately? That was fun, wasn't it? It didn't do much damage, but all that smoke made it kind of like reality. Great stuff. Midori chugged down another glass of water, took a breath, and studied my face for a while. Hey, what's wrong with you? She asked. You've got this spaced out look. Your eyes aren't focused. I'm okay, I said. I just got back from a trip and I'm kind of tired. You look like you've just seen a ghost. I see. Hey, do you have classes this afternoon? German and religion. 
Can you skip him? Not German. I've got a test today. When's it over? Two. Okay. How about going into the city with me after that for some drinks? Drinks at two o'clock in the afternoon? For a change? Why not? You look so spaced. Come on, go drinking with me and get a little life into you. That's what I want to do: drink with you and get some life into myself. What do you say? Okay, let's go. I said with a sigh. I'll look for you in the lit quad at two. After German, we caught a bus to Shinjuku, and went to an underground bar called Dug, behind the Kinokuniya bookstore. We each started with two vodka and tonics. I come here once in a while, she said. They don't embarrass you about drinking in the afternoon. Do you drink in the afternoon a lot? Sometimes, she said, rattling the ice in her glass. Sometimes, when the world gets hard to live in, I come here for a vodka and tonic. Sometimes," said Midori. "I've got my own special little problems. Like what? Like family, like boyfriends, like irregular periods, stuff. So have another drink. I will. I waved the waiter over and ordered two more vodka and tonics. Remember how, when you came over that Sunday, you kissed me? Midori asked. I've been thinking about it. That was nice, really nice. That's nice. That's nice. She mimicked me. The way you talk is so weird. It is. Anyhow, I was thinking that time. I was thinking how great it would be if that had been the first time in my life a boy had kissed me. If I could switch around the order of my life, I would absolutely, absolutely make that my first kiss. And then I would live the rest of my life thinking stuff like, "Hey, I wonder what happened to that boy named Watanabe I gave my first kiss to on the laundry deck. Now that he's fifty-eight, wouldn't that be great?" Yeah, really. I said, cracking open a pistachio nut. Hey, what is it with you? Why are you so spaced out? You still haven't answered me. I probably still haven't completely adapted to the world. I said after giving it some thought. I don't know. I feel like this isn't the real world. The people, the scene, they just don't seem real to me. Midori rested an elbow on the bar and looked at me. There was something like that in a Jim Morrison song. I'm pretty sure. People are strange when you're a stranger. Peace, said Midori. Peace, I said. You really ought to go to Uruguay with me. Midori said, still leaning on the bar. Girlfriend, family, school—just dump 'em all. Not a bad idea, I said, laughing. Don't you think it would be wonderful to get rid of everything and everybody and just go someplace where you don't know a soul? Sometimes I feel like doing that. I really, really want to do it sometimes. So, like, say you whisk me away somewhere far, far away. I'd make a pile of babies for you, as tough as little bulls, and we'd all live happily ever after, rolling on the floor. I laughed and drank down my third vodka and tonic. I guess you don't really want a pile of babies as tough as little bulls yet," said Midori. "I'm tremendously interested," I said. "I'd like to see what they look like." "That's okay. You don't have to want them," said Midori, eating a pistachio. "Here I am." Drinking in the afternoon, saying whatever pops into my head. I want to dump everything and run off somewhere. What's the point of going to Uruguay? All they've got there is donkey shit. Donkey shit everywhere. You may be right. Here is shit. There is shit. The whole world is donkey shit. Hey, I can't open this. You take it. Midori handed me a pistachio with an uncracked shell. I struggled with it until I got it open. But oh. Gee, what a relief it was last Sunday, going up to the laundry deck with you, watching the fire, drinking beer, singing songs. I don't know how long it's been since I had such a total sense of relief. People are always trying to force stuff on me. The minute they see me, they start telling me what to do. At least you don't try to force stuff on me. I don't know you well enough to force stuff on you.
You mean, if you knew me better, you'd force stuff on me like everybody else? It's possible, I said. That's how people live in the real world, forcing stuff on each other. You wouldn't do that. I can tell. I'm an expert when it comes to forcing stuff and having stuff forced on you. You're just not that type. That's why I can relax with you. Do you have any idea how many people there are in the world who like to force stuff on people and have stuff forced on them? Tons. And then they make a big fuss like, I forced her, you forced me. That's what they like. But I don't like it. I just do it because I have to. What kind of stuff do you force on people or do they force on you? Midori put a piece of ice in her mouth and sucked on it for a while. Do you want to get to know me better? She asked. Yeah, kind of. Hey, look, I just asked you, do you want to get to know me better? What the hell kind of answer is that? Yes, Midori, I would like to get to know you better, I said. Really? Yes, really. Even if you had to turn your eyes away from what you saw? Are you that bad? Well, in a way, Midori said with a frown. I want another drink. I called the waiter and ordered a fourth round of drinks. Until they came, Midori cupped her chin in her hand with her elbow on the bar. I kept quiet and listened to Thelonious Monk playing Honeysuckle Rose. There were five or six other customers in the place, but we were the only ones drinking alcohol. The rich smell of coffee gave the gloomy interior an intimate atmosphere. Are you free this Sunday? Midori asked. I think I told you before I'm always free on Sunday, until I go to work at six. Okay, then. This Sunday, will you hang out with me? Sure, I said. I'll pick you up at your dorm Sunday morning. I'm not sure exactly what time, though. Is that okay? Fine, I said. No problem. Now, let me ask you. Do you have any idea what I would like to do right now? I can't imagine. Well, first of all, I want to lie down on a big, wide, fluffy bed. I want to get all comfy and drunk and not have any donkey shit anywhere nearby. And I want to have you lying down next to me. And then, little by little, you take my clothes off. So tenderly. The way a mother takes a little child's clothing off. Mm. So soft. And I'm just spacing out and feeling really nice until all of a sudden I realize what's happening and I yell at you, Stop it, Watanabe! And then I say, I really like you, Watanabe, but I'm seeing someone else. I can't do this. I'm very proper about these things. Believe it or not, so please stop. But you don't stop. But I would stop, I said. I know that. Never mind. This is just my fantasy, said Midori. So then you show it to me, your thing sticking way up. I immediately cover my eyes, of course, but I can't help seeing it for a split second. And I say, stop it. Don't do that. I don't want anything so big and hard. It's not so big, just ordinary. Never mind. This is a fantasy. So then you put on this really sad face, and I feel sorry for you and try to comfort you. There, there, poor thing. And you're telling me that's what you want to do now? That's it. Oh, brother. We left the bar after five rounds of vodka and tonic. When I tried to pay, Midori slapped my hand and paid with a brand new 10,000 yen bill she took from her purse. It's okay, she said. I just got paid, and I invited you. Of course, if you're a card-carrying fascist and you refuse to let a woman buy you a drink, no, no, I'm okay. And I didn't let you put it in either. Because it's so big and hard, I said. Right, said Midori. Because it's so big and hard. A little drunk, Midori missed one step, and we almost fell back down the stairs. The layer of clouds that had darkened the sky before was gone now and the late afternoon sun poured its gentle light on the city streets. Midori and I strolled those streets for a time. Midori said she wanted to climb a tree, but unfortunately there were no climbable trees in Shinjuku, and the Shinjuku Imperial Gardens were closing. Too bad, said Midori. 
I love to climb trees. We continued walking and window shopping, and soon the street scene seemed realer to me than it had before. I'm glad I ran into you, I said. I think I'm a little more adapted to the world now. Midori stopped short and peered at me. It's true, she said. Your eyes are much more in focus than they were. See? Hanging out with me does you good. No doubt about it, I said. At 5.30, Midori said she had to go home and make dinner. I said I would take a bus back to my dorm, and I saw her as far as the station. Know what I want to do now? Midori asked me as she was leaving. I have absolutely no idea what you could be you thinking. You and me to be captured by pirates. Then they strip us and press us together face to face, all naked, and wind these ropes around us. Why would they do a thing like that? Perverted pirates, she said. You're the perverted one, I said. So then they lock us in the hold and say, In one hour, we're going to throw you into the sea, so have a good time until then. And? And so we enjoy ourselves for an hour, rolling all over the place and twisting our bodies. And that's the main thing you want to do now? That's it. Oh, brother, I said, shaking my head. Midori came to pick me up at 9.30 on Sunday morning. I had just awakened and hadn't washed my face yet. Somebody pounded on my door and yelled, Hey, Watanabe, it's a woman! I went down to the lobby to find Midori wearing an incredibly short jean skirt and sitting there with her legs crossed, yawning. Every guy passing through on his way to breakfast slowed down to stare at her long, slim legs. She did have really nice legs. Am I too early? She asked. I bet you just woke up. Can you give me 15 minutes? I'll wash my face and shave. I don't mind waiting, but all these guys are staring at my legs. What'd you expect, coming into a men's dorm in such a short skirt? Of course they're going to stare at you. Oh, well, it's okay. I'm wearing really cute panties today, all pink and frilly and lacy. That just makes it worse, I said with a sigh. I went back to my room and washed and shaved as fast as I could, put on a blue button-down shirt and a gray tweed sports coat then went back down and hurried Midori out through the dorm gate. I was in a cold sweat. Tell me, Watanabe, Midori said, looking up at the dorm buildings. Do all the guys in here masturbate? Rub-a-dub-dub? Probably, I said. Do guys think about girls when they do that? I guess so. I kind of doubt that anybody thinks about the stock market or verb conjugations or the Suez Canal when they masturbate. Now, I'm pretty sure just about everybody thinks about girls. The Suez Canal? For example, I mean. So I guess they think about particular girls, right? Shouldn't you be asking your boyfriend about that? I said. Why should I have to explain stuff like that to you on a Sunday morning? I was just curious, she said. Besides, he'd get mad if I asked him about stuff like that. He'd say girls aren't supposed to ask all those questions. A perfectly normal point of view, I'd say. But I want to know. This is pure curiosity. Do guys think about particular girls when they masturbate? I gave up trying to avoid the question. Well, I do at least. I don't know about anybody else. Have you ever thought about me when you were doing it? Tell me the truth. I won't get mad. No, I haven't, to tell you the truth, I answered honestly. Why not? Aren't I attractive enough? Oh, you're plenty attractive, all right. You're cute well, and sexy outfits look good on you. Well, first of all, I think of you as a friend, so I don't want to get you involved in my sexual fantasies. And second, you've got somebody else you're supposed to be thinking about. That's about the size of it, I said. You have good manners, even when it comes to something like this, Midori said. That's what I like about you. Still, couldn't you allow me just one brief appearance? I want to be in one of your sexual fantasies or daydreams or whatever you call them. I'm asking you because we're friends. Who else can I ask for something like that? I can't just walk up to anyone and say, 
When you masturbate tonight, will you please think of me for a second? It's because I think of you as a friend that I'm asking. And I want you to tell me later what it was like. You know, what you did and stuff. I let out a sigh. You can't put it in, though, because we're just friends, right? As long as you don't put it in, you can do anything you like. Think anything you want. I don't know. I've never done it with so many restrictions before, I said. Will you just think about me? All right. I'll think about you. You know, Watanabe? I don't want you to get the wrong impression that I'm a nymphomaniac or frustrated or a tease or anything. I'm just interested in that stuff. I want to know about it. I grew up surrounded by nothing but girls in a girls' school. You know that. I want to find out what guys are thinking and how their bodies are put together. And not just from pull out sections in the women's magazines, but in actual case studies. Case studies? I groaned. But my boyfriend doesn't like it when I want to know things or try things. He gets mad, calls me a nympho or crazy. He won't even let me give him a blowjob. Now that's one thing I'm dying to study. Uh huh. Do you hate getting blowjobs? No, not really. I don't hate it. Would you say you like it? Yeah, I'd say that. But can we talk about this next time? Here it is, a really nice Sunday morning, and I don't want to ruin it talking about masturbation and blowjobs. Let's talk about something else. Is your boyfriend in the same university with us? Nope. He goes to another one, of course. We met in high school during a club activity. I was in a girls' school, and he was in a boys' school. And you know how they do those things, joint concerts and stuff. We got serious after graduation, though. Hey, Watanabe. What? You only have to do it once. Just think about me, okay? Okay, I'll give it a try next time. I said, throwing in the towel. We took a commuter train to Ochanomizu. When we transferred at Shinjuku, I bought a thin sandwich at a stand in the station to take the place of the breakfast I hadn't eaten. The coffee I had with it tasted like boiled printer's ink. The Sunday morning trains were filled with couples and with families on outings. A group of boys with baseball bats and matching uniforms scampered around inside the car. Several of the girls on the train had short skirts on, but none as short as Midori's. Midori would yank on hers every now and then to bring it lower. Some of the men stared at her thighs, which made me feel uneasy. But she didn't seem to mind. Midori whispered to me when we had been riding for some ten minutes. No idea, I said. But please, don't talk about that stuff here. Somebody will hear you. Too bad. This one's kind of wild, Midori said with obvious disappointment. Anyhow, why are we going to Ochanomizu? Just come along, you'll see. With all the cram schools around Ochanomizu Station, on Sunday the area was full of junior high and high school kids on their way to practice exams or classes. Midori plunged through the crowds, clutching her shoulder bag strap with one hand and my hand with the other. Without warning, she asked me, Hey, Watanabe, can you explain the difference between the English subjunctive present and the subjunctive past? I think I can, I said. Let me ask you then, what purpose does stuff like that serve in daily life? None at all, I said. It may not serve any concrete purpose, but it does give you some kind of training to help you grasp things in general more systematically. Midori took a moment to give that some serious thought. You're amazing, she said. That never occurred to me before. I always thought of things like the subjunctive case and differential calculus and chemical symbols as totally useless, a pain in the neck. So I've always ignored them. Now I have to wonder if my whole life has been a mistake. You've ignored them? Yeah. Like, for me, they didn't exist. I don't have the slightest idea what sine and cosine mean. That's incredible. How'd you graduate from high school? How'd you get into college? Don't be silly, said Midori. You don't have to know anything to pass college entrance exams. All you need is a little intuition. 
and I have great intuition. Choose the correct answer from the following three. I know immediately which one is right. My intuition's not as good as yours, so I have to learn systematic thinking to some extent, like the way a crow collects chunks of glass in a hollow tree. Does it serve some purpose? I wonder. It probably makes it easier to do some kinds of things. What kinds of things? Give me an example. Metaphysical thought, say, mastering several languages. What good does that do? It depends on the person who does it. It serves a purpose for some and not for others, but mainly it's training. Whether it serves a purpose or not is another question. Like I said, hmm," said Midori, seemingly impressed. She led me by the hand down the hill. You know, Watanabe, you're really good at explaining things to people. I wonder," I said. "It's true. I've asked hundreds of people what good the English subjunctive is." And not one of them gave me a good, clear answer like yours. Not even English teachers. They either got confused or angry or laughed it off. Nobody gave me a decent answer before. If somebody like you had been around when I asked my question, and given me a proper explanation, even I might have been interested in the subjunctive. I、Damn. said. Have you ever read Das Kapital? Yep. Not the whole thing, of course, but parts, like most people. Did you understand it? I understood some parts, not others. You have to acquire the necessary intellectual apparatus to read a book like Das Kapital. I think I understand the general idea of Marxism, though. Do you think a college freshman who hasn't read books like that can understand Das Kapital just by reading it? That's pretty nearly impossible, I'd say. You know. When I entered the university, I joined a folk music club. I just wanted to sing songs, but the members were a pack of phonies. I get chills just thinking about them. The first thing they tell you when you enter the club is you have to read Marx. Prepare page so and so to such and such for next time. Somebody lectured on how folk songs have to be deeply involved with society and the radical movement. So what the hell? I went home and tried as hard as I could to read it, but I didn't understand a thing. It was worse than the subjunctive. I gave up after three pages. So I went to the next week's meeting like a good little scout and said I had read it, but that I couldn't understand it. From that point on, they treated me like an idiot. I had no critical awareness of the class struggle. They said I was a social cripple. I mean, this was serious. And all because I said I couldn't understand a piece of writing. Don't you think they were terrible? Uh huh, I said. And their so-called discussions were terrible too. Everybody would use big words and pretend they knew what was going on, but I would ask questions whenever I didn't understand something. What is this imperialist exploitation stuff you're talking about? Is it connected somehow to the East India Company? Does smashing the educational industrial complex mean we're not supposed to work for a company after we graduate from college, and stuff like that? But nobody was willing to explain anything to me. Far from it. They got mad at me. Can you believe it? Yeah, I can. I said. One guy yelled at me. You stupid bitch! How do you live like that with nothing in your brain? Well, that did it as far as I was concerned. I wasn't going to put up with it. Okay, so I'm not so smart. I'm working class, but it's the working class that keeps the world running, and it's the working class that gets exploited. What the hell kind of revolution have you got? Just tossing out big words that working class people can't understand. What the hell kind of social revolution is that? I mean, I'd like to make the world a better place too. If somebody's really being exploited, we've got to put a stop to it. That's what I believe, and that's why I ask questions. Am I right or what? You're right. So that's when it hit me. These guys are a bunch of phonies. All they've got on their minds is impressing the new girls with the big words they're so proud of, and sticking their hands up their skirts. And when they're seniors, they cut their hair short and go trooping to work for Mitsubishi or IBM or Fuji Bank. They marry pretty wives who've never read Marx and have kids they give fancy new names to that are enough to make you puke. 
Smash what educational industrial complex? Don't make me laugh. And the new members were just as bad. They didn't understand a thing either, but they'd made believe they did, and they were laughing at me. After the meeting, they told me, "Don't be silly. So what if you don't understand? Just agree with everything they say." Hey, Watanabe, I've got stuff that made me even madder than that. Want to hear? One time, sure. They、not? called a late night political meeting, and they told the girls to make twenty rice balls each for midnight snacks. I mean, talk about sex discrimination. I decided to keep quiet for a change, though, and showed up like a good girl with my twenty rice balls, complete with umeboshi inside and nori outside. And what do you think I got for my efforts? Afterward, people complained because my rice balls had only umeboshi inside, and I hadn't brought along anything to go with them. The other girls stuffed theirs with cod roe and salmon, and they included nice thick slices of fried egg. I got so mad I couldn't talk. Where the hell did these revolution mongers get off making a fuss over rice balls? They should be grateful for umeboshi and nori. Think about the children starving in India. I laughed. So then, what happened with your club? I quit in June. I was so damn mad, Midori said. Most of these university types are total phonies. They're scared to death somebody's going to find out they don't know something. They all read the same books and they all throw around the same words, and they get off listening to John Coltrane and seeing Pasolini movies. You call that revolution? Hey, don't ask me. I've never actually seen a revolution. Well, if that's revolution, you can have it. They probably shoot me for putting umeboshi in my rice balls. They shoot you too for understanding the subjunctive. It could happen. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about. I'm working class. Revolution or no, the working class is going to have to keep scraping by in the same old shitholes. And what is a revolution? It sure as hell isn't just changing the name on city hall. But those guys don't know that. Those guys with their big words. Tell me, Watanabe, have you ever seen a tax man? Never have. Well, I have. Lots of times. They come barging in and acting big. What's this ledger for? Hey, you keep pretty sloppy records. You call this a business expense? I want to see all your receipts right now. Meanwhile, we're crouching in the corner, and when supper time comes, we've got to treat them to sushi deluxe, home delivered. Let me tell you though, my father never once cheated on his taxes. That's just how he is—a real old-fashioned straight arrow. But tell that to the tax man. All he can do is dig and dig and dig and dig. Income's a little low here, don't you think? Well, of course the income's low when you're not making any money. I wanted to scream, "Go do this where they've got some money!" Do you think the taxman's attitude would change if there was a revolution? Highly doubtful. Highly doubtful. That does it for me then. I'm not going to believe in any damn revolution. Love is all I'm going to believe in. Peace, I said. Say, Peace. Where are we headed? Midori, I asked. The hospital, she said. My father's there. It's my turn to stay with him all day. Your father? I thought he was in Uruguay. That was a lie, said Midori, as if it was nothing at all. He's been screaming about going to Uruguay forever, but he could never do that. He can hardly get himself out of Tokyo. How bad is he? I asked. It's just a matter of time, she said. We moved several paces ahead without a word. I know what I'm talking about. It's the same thing my mother had—a brain tumor. Can you believe it? It's hardly been two years since a brain tumor killed her, and now he's got one. The university hospital corridors were noisy and crowded with weekend visitors and patients who had less serious symptoms, and everywhere hung that special hospital smell—a cloud of disinfectant and visitors' bouquets and urine and mattresses, through which nurses surged back and forth with a dry clattering of heels. Midori's father was in a semi-private room in the bed nearer the door. 
Stretched out, he looked like some tiny creature with a fatal wound. He lay on his side, limp, the drooping left arm inert, jabbed with an intravenous needle. He was a skinny, little man who gave the impression that he would get only skinnier and littler. A white bandage encircled his head, and his pasty white arms were dotted with the wounds left by injections or intravenous feedings. His half-open eyes stared at a fixed point in space, but the bloodshot spheres twitched in our direction when we entered the room. For some ten seconds they stayed focused on us, then drifted back to that fixed point in space. He was going to die soon. You knew when you saw those eyes. There was no sign of life in his flesh, just the barest traces of what had once been a life. His body was like a dilapidated old house from which all furniture and fixtures had been removed and which awaited now only its final demolition. Around the dry lips sprouted clumps of whiskers like so many weeds. So, I thought, even after so much of his life force had been lost, a man's beard continued to grow. Midori said hello to the ample flesh man in the bed by the window. He nodded and smiled, apparently unable to talk. He coughed a few times, and after sipping some water from a glass by his pillow, he shifted his weight in bed and rolled on his side, turning his gaze out the window. Beyond the window could be seen only a utility pole and some power lines. Nothing more. Not even a cloud in the sky. How are you feeling, Daddy? said Midori, speaking into her father's ear as if testing a microphone. How are you today? Her father moved his lips. Not good, he said, not so much speaking the words as forming them from dried air at the back of his throat. Head, he said. You have a headache? Midori asked. Yeah, he said, seemingly incapable of pronouncing more than a syllable or two at a time. Well, no wonder, she said. You've just had your head cut open. Of course it hurts. Too bad, but try to stand it a little more. This is my friend Watanabe. Glad to meet you, I said. Midori's father opened his lips part way, then closed them again. Midori gestured toward a vinyl stool near the foot of the bed and suggested that I sit. I did as I was told. Midori gave her father a drink of water and asked if he'd like a piece of fruit or some gelled fruit dessert. No. He said. And when Midori insisted that he had to eat something, he said, I ate. A night table stood near the head of the bed, holding a water bottle, a glass, a dish, and a small clock. From a large paper bag under the table, Midori took some fresh pajamas, underwear, and other things, straightened them out, and put them into the locker that stood by the door. Food for the patient lay in the bottom of the bag. Two grapefruits, fruit jelly, and three cucumbers. Cucumbers? What are these doing in here? Midori asked. I can't imagine what my sister was thinking. I told her on the phone exactly what I wanted her to buy, and I'm sure I never mentioned cucumbers. She was supposed to bring kiwi fruit. Maybe she misunderstood you, I suggested. Yeah, maybe, but if she had thought about it, she would have realized that cucumbers couldn't be right. I mean, what's a hospital patient supposed to do? Sit in bed chewing on raw cucumbers? Hey, Daddy, want a cucumber? No, said Midori's father. Midori sat by the head of the bed, telling her father bits and pieces of news from home. The TV picture had gone bad, and she'd called the repairman. Their aunt from Takaido had said she would come to visit in a few days. The druggist, Mr. Miyawaki, had fallen off his bike. Stuff like that. Her father responded with grunts. Are you sure you don't want anything to eat? No, her father answered. How about you, Watanabe? Some grapefruit? No, I answered. A few minutes later, Midori took me to the TV room and smoked a cigarette on the sofa. Three patients in pajamas were also smoking there and watching some kind of political Whispered discussion Midori with a twinkle in her eye. That old guy with the crutches, 
has been looking at my legs ever since we came in here. The one with glasses and the blue pajamas. What do you expect wearing a skirt like that? It's nice, though. I bet they're all bored. It probably does them good. Maybe the excitement helps them get well faster. As long as it doesn't have the opposite effect, I suppose. Midori stared at the smoke rising straight up from her cigarette. You know, she said, my father's not such a bad guy. I get mad at him sometimes because he says terrible things, but deep down, he's honest, and he really loved my mother. In his own way, he's lived life with all the intensity he could muster. He's a little weak, maybe, and he has absolutely no head for business, and people don't like him very much. But he's a hell of a lot better than the cheats and liars who go around smoothing things over because they're so slick. I'm as bad as he is about not backing down once I've said something. So we fight a lot. But really, he's not a bad guy. Midori took my hand, as if she were picking up something someone had dropped in the street, and placed it on her lap. Half my hand lay atop the cloth of her skirt, while the other half was touching her thigh. She looked into my eyes for a while. Sorry to bring you to a place like this, she said. But would you mind staying with me a little longer? I'll stay with you all day if you want, I said, until five. I like spending time with you, and I've got nothing else to do. How do you usually spend your Sundays? Doing laundry, I said, and ironing. I guess you don't want to tell me too much about her. Your girlfriend? No, I guess not. It's complicated, and I kind of don't think I could explain it very well. That's okay. You don't have to explain anything, said Midori. But do you mind if I tell you what I imagine is going on? No, go ahead. I suspect anything you'd imagine would have to be interesting. I think she's a married woman. You do? Yeah. She's 32 or 3, and she's rich and beautiful, and she wears fur coats and Charles Jordan shoes and silk underwear, and she's hungry for sex, and she likes to do really yucky things. The two of you meet on weekday afternoons and devour each other's bodies. But her husband's home on Sundays, so she can't see you. Am I right? Very, very interesting. She has you tie her up and blindfold her and lick every square inch of her body. Then she makes you put weird things inside her and she gets into these incredible positions like a contortionist. And you take pictures of her with a Polaroid camera. She's dying for Sounds it all the like time. Fun. So she does everything she can think of. And she thinks about it every day. She's got nothing but free time, so she's always planning. Hmm, next time Watanabe comes, we'll do this or we'll do that. You get in bed and she goes crazy trying all these positions and coming three times in every one. And she says to you, Don't I have a sensational body? You can't be satisfied with young girls anymore. Young girls won't do this for you, will they? Or this. Feel good? But don't come yet. You've been seeing too many porno flicks, I said with a laugh. You think so? I was kind of worried about that. But I love porno flicks. Take me to one next time, okay? Fine, I said. Next time you're free. Really? I can hardly wait. Let's go to a real S&M one. With whips and, like, they make the girl pee in front of everybody. That's my favorite. We'll do it. You know what I like best about porno theaters? I couldn't begin to guess. Whenever a sex scene starts, you can hear this gulp sound when everybody swallows all at once, said Midori. I love that gulp. It's so sweet. Back in the hospital room, Midori aimed a stream of talk at her father again. And he would either grunt in response or say nothing. Around 11, the wife of the man in the other bed came to change her husband's pajamas and peel fruit for him and such. She had a round face and seemed like a nice person. And she and Midori shared a lot of small talk. A nurse showed up with a new intravenous feeding bottle and talked a little while with Midori and the wife before she left. I let my eyes wander around the room and out the window to the power lines. Sparrows would show up every now and then and perch on the lines. 
Midori talked to her father and wiped the sweat from his brow and let him spit phlegm into a tissue and chatted with the neighbor's wife and the nurse and sent an occasional remark my way and checked the intravenous contraption. The doctor came on rounds at 11.30, so Midori and I stepped outside to wait in the corridor. When he came out, Midori asked him how her father was doing. Well, he's just come out of surgery, and we've got him on painkillers, so, well, he's pretty drained, said the doctor. I'll need another two or three days to evaluate the results of the operation. If it went well, he'll be okay. And if it didn't... We'll have to make some decisions at that point. You're not going to open his head up again, are you? I really can't say until the time comes, said the doctor. Wow, that's some short skirt you're wearing. Nice, huh? What do you do on stairways? The doctor asked. Nothing special. I let it all hang out, said Midori. The nurse chuckled behind the doctor. Incredible. You ought to come and let us open your head one of these days to see what's going on in there. Do me a favor, and use the elevators while you're in the hospital. I can't afford to have any more patients. I'm way too busy Soon as it is. After the doctor's rounds, it was lunchtime. A nurse pushing a cart loaded with meals was circulating from room to room. Midori's father was given potage, fruit, boiled deboned fish, and vegetables that had been ground into some kind of jelly. Midori turned him on his back and raised him up using the crank at the foot of the bed. She fed him the soup with a spoon. After five or six swallows, he turned his face aside and said, No more. You've got to eat at least this much, Midori said. Later, he said. You're hopeless. If you don't eat properly, you'll never get your strength back, she said. Don't you have to pee yet? No. He said, Hey, Watanabe, let's go down to the cafeteria. I agreed to go, but in fact, I didn't feel much like eating. The cafeteria was crammed with doctors and nurses and visitors. Long lines of chairs and tables filled the huge, windowless underground cavern where every mouth seemed to be eating and talking. About sickness, no doubt. The voices echoing and re echoing as in a tunnel. Now and then, the PA system would break through the reverberation with calls for a doctor or nurse. While I laid claim to a table, Midori bought two set meals and carried them over on an aluminum tray. Croquettes with cream sauce, potato salad, shredded cabbage, boiled vegetables, rice, and miso soup. These were lined up in the tray in the same white plastic dishes they use for patients. I ate about half of mine and left the rest. Midori seemed to enjoy her meal to the last mouthful. You're not too hungry? she asked, sipping hot tea. Not really, I said. It's the hospital, she said, scanning the cafeteria. This always happens when people aren't used to the place. The smells, the sounds, the stale air, patients' faces, stress, irritation, disappointment, pain, fatigue. All those things are what do it. They grab you in the stomach and kill your appetite. Once you get used to them, though, they're no problem at all. Plus, you can't really take care of a sick person unless you eat right. It's true. I know what I'm talking about because I've done it with my grandfather, my grandmother, my mother, and now my father. You never know when you're going to have to miss your next meal, so it's important to eat when you can. I see what you mean, I said. Relatives come to visit and they eat with me here and they always leave half their food, just like you. And they always say, Oh, Midori, it's wonderful you've got such a healthy appetite. I'm too upset to eat. But get serious. I'm the one who's actually here taking care of the patient. They just have to stop by and show a little sympathy. I'm the one who wipes the shit and takes the phlegm and dries the bodies off. If sympathy was all it took to clean up shit, I'd have 50 Instead, times as much sympathy as anybody else. They see me eating all my food, and they give me this look and say, Oh, Midori, you've got such a healthy appetite. What do they think I am, a donkey pulling a cart? They're old enough to know how the world really works, so why are they so stupid? It's easy to talk big, but the important thing is whether or not you clean up the shit. I can be hurt, you know. 
I can get as exhausted as anybody else. I can feel so bad, I want to cry too. I mean, you try watching a gang of doctors get together and cut open somebody's head when there's no hope of saving them, and stirring things up in there, and doing it again and again, and every time they do it, it makes the person worse and a little bit crazier, and see how you like it. And on top of it, you see your savings go to hell. I don't know if I can keep going to school another three and a half years, and there's no way my sister can afford a wedding ceremony at this rate. How many days do you come here in a week? I asked. Usually four, said Midori. This place claims they offer total nursing care, and the nurses themselves are great, but there's just too much for them to do. Some member of the family has to be around to take up the slack. My sister's watching the store. And I've got my classes. Still, she manages to get here three days a week, and I come four. And we sneak in a little time for a date now and then. Believe me, it's a full schedule. How can you spend time with me if you're so busy? I like spending time with you," said Midori, playing with a plastic teacup. "Get out of here for a couple of hours and go take a walk," I said. I'll take care of your father for a while. Why? You need to get away from the hospital, and relax by yourself. Not talk to anybody. Just clear your mind out. Midori thought about it for a minute and nodded. Hmm. You may be right. But do you know what to do? How to take care of him? I've been watching. I've pretty much got it. You check the intravenous thing. Give him water, wipe the sweat off, and help him spit phlegm. The bedpan's under the bed, and if he gets hungry, I feed him the rest of his lunch. Anything I can't figure out, I'll ask the nurse. I think that should do it," Midori said with a smile. "There's just one thing, though. He's starting to get a little funny in the head, so he says weird things once in a while, things that nobody can understand." Don't let it bother you if he does that. I'll be fine," I said. This ends disc seven. 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 Seven ends. Disc seven ends.